With that, I'll call to order the regular meeting of council for Tuesday, October the 16th. Are there any changes, additions to the agenda? Seeing none, I'll move the agenda be approved as presented. Those in favor, opposed, motions carried unanimously. Look into the minutes of the October 2nd meeting of council. Are there errors or omissions? Seeing none, I'll move they be adopted as presented. Those in favor, opposed, motions carried unanimously. Moving on then to item F1, bylaw 2018-25, Spring Creek Mountain Village, stage two, public district amendments. Monsieur. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. Bylaw 2018-25 proposes a land use amendment to adjust the boundary of a public use district in stage two of Spring Creek Mountain Village so that it matches the boundaries of parcels planned for future stage two subdivisions. Start with a bit of context for you. The blue area up on the screen represents the subject PD district. As I mentioned, it is located in stage two of Spring Creek Mountain Village. The Spring Creek Mountain Village Comprehensive Residential District and the Manufactured Home Park Family Residential District border it. With the exception of the area where Spring Creek Drive crosses, the PD district encompasses land that will be designated municipal reserve through future subdivisions. Of note, Spring Creek Mountain Village, through commitments made in their area redevelopment plan, must provide 15% of the total developable land as municipal reserve, generally as shown in the plan's open space and trails map. To ensure full provision, a deferred reserve caveat is registered on title of the main Spring Creek Mountain Village parcel and updated each time new municipal reserve is dedicated through subdivision. This works sort of like a bank account where you have an initial balance and you just keep making withdrawals until all of it's been provided throughout the community, the 15% and you can carry some of that over to different stages and so forth. So why the change? Uh, well, earlier in the year, Spring Creek Mountain Village began creating detailed designs for the lots adjacent to the PD district. This exercise identified a need for more development flexibility. Spring Creek Mountain Village is therefore proposing a new layout for the future MR and adjacent parcels and their respective buildings, which requires adjusting the boundaries of the PD district. Uh, if I can draw your attention up to the, the screen, the image on the left, shows the existing PD boundary highlighted in green. The image on the right shows that existing boundary now in red and the green now represents the proposed change. You'll notice lot 19 or the, the, the uh, bolded lot uh, in the up, uh, upper right hand corner. Uh, that's a conceptual lot that doesn't exist yet. It hasn't been subdivided and lot 20 is on the um, on the east side of the, the PD boundary, that's also conceptual. Uh, Spring Creek wanted to adjust those lot boundaries essentially because the existing lines of the PD were um, irregular shaped and so it's easier to design buildings or build buildings when you have straight lines. So they've made lot 19 or conceptual lot 19 a bit bigger and they've made conceptual lot 20 a bit smaller to compensate. So, how does this affect future MR? Uh, the ARP describes the intent of this land as a central park feature southwest of the village square with trail connections to the perimeter trail system and links to Millennium Park. Spring Creek Mountain Village has provided a conceptual plan for the future MR and as well a detailed landscaping plan which is showed up on the screen. Uh, both of which were provided with you uh, in the package for council to demonstrate how this space could be designed. The landscaping plan shows landscaping, pathway connections, as well as park features such as two playgrounds and seating areas to allow for multi-use. Administration believes that the plans provided demonstrate the proposed space is in accordance with the ARP. It should be noted that the proposed changes do increase the size of the PD district um, and therefore the future MR uh, by an area of 231 square meters. The additional area comes from uh, boundary adjustments made in 2016. Uh, a number of pie-shaped PD lots uh, slash future MR parcels uh, were reduced uh, in area by sort of straightening those out and that left some uh, additional MR that was never taken through those future subdivisions. And as I mentioned, it was still on the bank so you could carry it over and use it here. Um, using the additional uh, MR here to enlarge this location, uh, an administration's opinion makes sense uh, given that it's not only a trail connector but also a, a destination. 
So in conclusion, administration recommends that council give first reading to bylaw 2018-25 and schedule a public hearing for November 6th, 2018 at 5 p.m. That concludes my presentation. Happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. A um, couple of questions. Um, so 15% of the total developable land SBMR. Do you have any idea uh, today how much MR has been dedicated or in, the, in acres, I mean, or in... I couldn't land? tell you offhand the amount that remains. Um, so is it? I'd say they've... Uh, let pull up this map here. I mean, I know, I know there's quite a bit of MR already dedicated. They've provided these pieces here, uh -huh. this piece here, that piece there, uh, the pieces up here in stage one. I think all of stage one has been provided. Uh, in terms of stage two, uh, we haven't received this, we haven't received this, uh, we haven't received. Sure. None of that's been... Yeah. in the development stage yet, so. Correct. Okay, that, that's helpful. Um, now in, uh, so some of the, of the land that would be affected by this boundary change is designated currently as MR? Uh, no, it's no. not. Uh, it's all, it's all it's parent been, parcel, yeah, it hasn't been subdivided okay. uh, or designated. So it's, it's zone PD, but it hasn't been designated yet? Correct. So. You go up here, um, this is all, uh, or this has been, this parcel has been subdivided off. This is part of the parent parcel, this is part of the parent parcel, and the rest is all part of the parent parcel. So it hasn't been, uh, no MR in that area has been provided yet. Okay. I have one other question, not that relevant to this discussion, but question that was sparked in reading through the supplemental information attached and it was from the what's the document called um, conceptual open space plan extension and uh, on the map number eight it, and then I think another map as well it notes uh, put certain buildings in the future as being potential building landmarks do you have any idea what's envisioned with that? Uh, not yet, but they're supposed to have a, a landmark feature as part of uh, the building on Lot 20, so that when you're coming down Spring Creek Drive, uh, you'll see uh, this feature sort of in front of you that uh, uh, it's like and an When arc. a planner says feature, what, what are you thinking? Uh, so like a, it'd be like a tower feature or something as part of the so building. It's, it's incorporated into the architectural design? Correct. But yeah. it's something... Something fancy that okay. looks really nice as you're driving down Spring Creek Drive. Okay, yeah. thank you. Welcome. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Mr. Gravel, for your presentation. Um, can you go back to that slide where you showed the landscape layout? Of that one. This one? Yeah. So the, um, I was kind of curious about squaring off that section of the, of that PD that or the, the realignment, yep. that gives them space to put a playground in there at that spot. Because that's yes. a fairly large space, right? So that there's gonna be a playground in that? So there's a playground right there. Right, okay. And a playground right there. So they put right. two playgrounds in there. And uh, was there a number of playgrounds that needed to be provided in the, as part of the ASP? Or do they just put them in spaces where there is space for it? Uh, so the ARP designates the park space um, and it talks about each uh, connector space or each um, type of park and what it should provide in terms of amenities. The ARP indicates that this park is really, um, the level of detail it provides is essentially it's a connection between the plaza and the creek and then uh, a destination, but it doesn't really, or a park, but it doesn't really define the uh, the elements or the amenities that would be provided. So Spring Creek is choosing to put playgrounds in those two spaces that it's creating from realigning the land? So they may not put two. Uh, this is just a conceptual uh, landscaping drawing. Um, but what you see in the, 
uh, written in the conceptual, uh, pardon me, this is the landscaping drawing and then you have the conceptual plan. The conceptual plan states the elements that would be provided, how that would look when they get to uh, the subdivision stage. It might look a little bit different than what you see here. This was just meant to show that there was enough space uh, to accommodate all of those elements. But there might be some changes as you get to a more detailed design. But by amalgamating the space, that I was curious about that squaring of that space, there is enough room to put a playground in there because yeah. of so the, the way the they're reconfiguring. Plan was, or pardon me, the landscaping plan was uh, circulated to engineering for review, and they had no objections to what was okay. shown. Yeah, I think that's a good use of the space, so thank you. Are there any questions this time for Mr. Gravel? See none, thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. With that, I'll move the council give first reading to bylaw 2018-25 and schedule a public hearing for November the 6th, 2018 at 5 p.m. Discussion on the motion. See none, I'll call the question. Those in favor, opposed, motions carried unanimously. Moving on then to item F2, bylaw 2018 13, 534 4th Street, rezoning R1 to R2. Mr. Williams. Somebody turned you off, not me. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor Boroughman and members of Town Council. My name is Richard Williams and I'm a junior planner here at the Town of Canmore. Uh, today I'm introducing for first reading the re rezoning of 530 4th Street from the R1 district to the R2 district, uh, also known as Bylaw 2018-30. Just to give you some context about uh, where 530 4th Street is located, We've got uh, Fifth Street running down the page uh, here in Centennial Park uh, up in the top left corner. The uh, property is circled in uh, red. Just to understand the current land use districts as they are in the bylaw, uh, the property is located within the R1 uh, district. We've got the R2 district uh, running down the side. The R4 district is across uh, Fifth Avenue and Centennial Park is located within the PD district. The proposed land use bylaw amendment is to change this property from R1 to R2 and move the demising line uh, from being on the left hand side to being on the right hand side. The rationale as supplied by the applicant is that the property is at a low point of the municipal sewer line. There is a history of sewage entering the existing uh, basement. The R2 district would create the opportunity to remove the existing home. Uh, with the basement and constructed duplex with new service connections and uh, with no basement. They intend to sell one half of the duplex to cover construction costs and remain in Canmore. Just a rundown of the main differences between the R1 district and the R2 district is that the uh, duplex building becomes a permitted use in the R2 district compared to not listed at all in the R1 district. It increases the maximum overall site coverage from 40% to 45%. A larger overall building on the property could be constructed as it's no longer restricted to the, um, to the 325 uh, gross floor area restriction in the R1 uh, district. And just to let you know that the setbacks and height requirements between both districts are the same. Sorry, could you go back to the earlier slide? One more? Yeah. Thank you. Just some direction by the, from the Municipal Development Plan and whereby Section 6, uh, the Neighbourhood Residential uh, section, talks about two goals that apply here uh, to this rezoning application in that uh, it seeks to minimise capital and operating infrastructure costs through promotion of efficient patterns uh, and density of residential development. Uh, furthermore, for Section, for goal number two, 
Uh, it allows for gradual redevelopment cha and change of established neighbourhoods to provide more housing variety, support the natural evolution of neighbourhoods and enhance the potential of residents to remain in their homes. Um, administration feels that uh, this application directly applies in to these uh, two goals. And with that, um, today I recommend that Council will provide first reading to bylaw 2018-13 and schedule a public hearing for November the 6th, 2018 at 5 p.m. And with that concludes my presentation this evening. Um, Battle will take any questions should you have any. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. So um, do you happen to know the history of um, that district and, and uh, some point in the not too distant past, the R2 district was created in South Camor uh, up to that certain line that's shown on your chart. Uh, I wasn't on council, so I, and I don't recall the conversation uh, at that time. I'm curious what would have been the rationale at that time to make the line look like it does there on the map. That is a question that we also do not have um, explicit uh, discussion about why that jog in the R1 to R2 line um, occurs at that specific uh, property. I always thought it was odd, frankly, but... Um, so, so on the slide that I um, directed you or looked back at, it notes that the properties at a low point in municipal sewer line. Is that property on the, uh, what do they call it, the low pressure system? Or it's no, it's just on the, um, not pressure rather than just gravity system uh, out from the basement. I mean, there's, there's a number of homes in South Camor that have typically had a lot of sewer backups, but I, my understanding is they're all in the low gravity system that had to pump up and that was a problem? So Correct. That there are a lot of properties in um, South Camor and, and in Spring Creek where a, a low pressure system is used as a way of conveying uh, surge. Uh, in this case the property is on the existing gravity uh, surge system. Okay. Uh, just a function of the connection being uh, through the basement and being at a point where the, the wastewater could uh, accumulate and flow um, in reverse rather than positive from the helmet. Thank you. Councillor Comfort. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, You're welcome. Just a question about, uh, would, you, would you characterize this as spot zoning, which we have been um, encouraged not to entertain? And I just wondered how you feel about that. Administration feels that it's, uh, it would not be considered spot zoning as it uh, is a, a adjustment of the R2 boundary. Uh, it does not create an island uh, of, um, of a new district or uh, surrounded by a similar district uh, on any boundaries. So it is more of a realignment rather than a spot zoning. Okay, thank you. Councillor McCallum. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Across the street from this residence, is there not a duplex being constructed as we speak? I'm, I'm unsure whether or not that's under construction right now, but there would uh, certainly be a permitted use directly across the street. So at any point, if it's not happening right so now. So there is our, it's R2 across, like directly across the street. Correct. I, I drove past here on my way to work, so I believe I saw construction there, and the, I thought it was a. There home. is construction happening in that neighborhood. Um, yeah. I'm not sure whether or not it's yeah, directly that property, but at any point in the future, if it's not happening today, it, it would be permitted use and, and it could occur. And so <clears throat> are we just being asked to consider uh, for first reading that lot or would we be looking to um, uh, adhere that designation to the whole block? The application so is for this property for alone, okay. um, any future application would stand on its merits. Gotcha, thank you. Just on that point, do you know if there's been any conversation with the adjacent property owners and 
I mean, there may be an interest in extending the R2 boundary more extensively rather than just that one lot. That was uh, encouraged um, to the applicant. Um, however, uh, it's not an obligation for them to uh, to connect with their um, other people that could benefit from a rezoning, and and uh, the reasons for their rezoning is is more um, historical rather than uh, am ambition to realign the um, the jog in in the district. It seems like a good opportunity to have that conversation with the neighborhood, though. I mean, rather than just doing one lot and then having other neighbors saying, oh, what about me? Sh sure. Uh, I mean, that is an opportunity. Um, I would note that the, the parcel uh, directly behind in the lane there is uh, the home it goes across both boundaries, and therefore it would be difficult for us to rezone, uh, rezone the half of it to one half of the uh, home being in the R2 and the other half being in the R1. I suppose we'll be able to hear from the neighbours at the public hearing and assess that interest or not. <coughs> Councillor, or oh, Mr. Fark, you had a <coughs> question? Thank you, had to clear my throat. Uh, uh, just to supplement uh, Mr. Williams' response. So we have no direction from council to pursue uh, additional rezoning in this neighborhood no. um, and to spend the time to canvas the neighborhood and to work with the number of different neighbors to try to come to a conclusion would be a significant resource allocation that we have no direction to pursue. So we have dealt with this application as an application as it has come in. As Mr. Williams has indicated, the applicant had the option to have that discussion with their neighbors, but it was not obligatory. So we would not have pursued that independently as administration because we don't have direction to do so. Thank you. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for your presentation. Um, would the new building codes require that the basement be a shallower structure? So, so it's um, it's in the engineering design guidelines rather than the building code, um, whereby they would not allow habitable space to be b below the one to one hundred uh, groundwater or um, or flood elevation. Uh, so that would uh, so that would apply to any new build in this area, and so it would. Uh, so they would have to rebuild it to that standard. Correct. It for would, sure. It would prohibit the construction of basements and all new uh, development. Okay, new and that buildings. doesn't affect the height. S so the land use bylaw directs us um, in a way that if the building is seeking to comply with uh, the one to one hundred groundwater elevation, we take that uh, new measurement as the start of the. Um, evaluation of the height as to not penalize the new construction creating a more resilient building uh, and so it's um, it's anticipated that that would be the new standard of height for this area regardless of uh, a duplex or a single family being constructed but they're not asking for a, <coughs> a variance on height but a new variance would come into play uh, so um, we don't have any plans submitted from the applicant as uh, this is a, the, the rezoning is uh, merely to create the opportunity for them to apply for a duplex building. Um, it's not anticipated that a variance would be entertained. However, a, a future application for a building or development permit would stand on its merits of the application. Um, but at this point in time, there's no request for that? Correct. Okay. And there is more site coverage from 40 to 45 percent. The difference between the R1 and R2 district means uh, a 5 percent difference between site coverage. And so uh, overall, the property could have a maximum coverage of 45 percent for two dwellings versus uh, 40 percent for one dwelling. Okay, or thank you. Dwelling plus suite. Um, I don't have any other questions. Anybody else? Thanks for your presentation. You're welcome. So this time, then, I'll move the council to give first reading to bylaw 2018. Wait a second. Before I give the motion, let me understand something. So the motion is 
essentially the same as the last motion to start the public hearing at five. So would we be advertising one public hearing for two items? Yes? And that's okay in the MGA, I guess, obviously. Thank you. So I'll move the council give first reading to bylaw 2018-13 and schedule a public hearing for November the 6th, 2018 at 5 p.m. Uh, speaking to the motion, um, I'm interested to hear from the neighbors from that uh, neighborhood and the residents uh, adjacent to this one property, whether there's, um, well, I'm interested to hear from the rest of the neighborhood which is an opportunity for them at the uh, public hearing uh, to the question of councillor comfort. In a way, it feels like uh, spot zoning, which council hasn't been very supportive of in the past. But uh, I understand the rationale with that uh, Mr. Williams provided. In any case, I'll support first reading so that we can go to public hearing and see what the public has to say. Anybody else care to speak to the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. Moving on then to item F3, public consumption of cannabis. Mr. Burt. And just to the folks sitting in the sun back there, if you move forward, there's actually no sun on the other seats. For some reason, that blind hasn't been adjusted. Mr. Rodney just likes to have the light shining on him, I know. <coughs> Mr. Burt. Good evening, Mayor Bowman, members of council. I'm back before you to talk about the public consumption of cannabis. Of what? The public consumption Canada? of cannabis. cannabis. Never heard of it. Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Interesting times. Mm -hmm. How did my recommendation come to be? I've been before you for several years uh, with several decisions, and I have to say this is by far the most challenging report and recommendation that I've had to draft, and here's why. There is so much uncertainty about the impacts of the legalization of cannabis tomorrow and how it will affect the landscape across Canmore, the Bow Valley, Alberta, and Canada. The legalization is unprecedented. Smoking or vaping cannabis doesn't align with the approaches to either alcohol or tobacco. As you know, Alcohol, you can't consume in public places, such as parks, sports fields, sidewalks. Yet you can consume it in a pub, a bar, a hotel room, or a B&B. &B. Whereas smoking tobacco, you can consume in public places, parks, sports fields, sidewalks. Yet you can't consume it in a pub, a bar, hotel room, or a B&B, &B, as we restricted under the bylaw. So that's where it gets a little bit challenging. Other things that I gave consideration to, council received letters from the, Bow Valley, or from the primary care network of Bow Valley and Alberta Health Services, both in support of a full ban with the rationale being, to summarize, cannabis is an intoxicating substance and therefore should be treated similarly to alcohol. Concerns about the harms related to second and third hand smoke, the risk of normalization of smoking, especially for children and youth, and taking a precautionary approach to minimize the unintended consequences of cannabis use. But it doesn't stop yet. <laughs> there isn't alignment across the country from the provincial government in terms of public consumption. So public consumption will be banned in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, PEI, and the Yukon, yet permitted under different regulations in other provinces. In Alberta, we'll go into more detail. As a refresher, the government has banned smoking or vaping of cannabis anywhere where smoking tobacco is prohibited, plus additional locations where tobacco is permitted, playgrounds, sports fields, etc. 
So as I looked across the country and realized there were a number of different prohibitions, it got me thinking about closer to home. Let me think about our neighbors to the west, Banff, full ban. Neighbor to the east, Calgary, <clears throat> excuse me, full ban, and they considered public consumption locations, however, they didn't proceed with it. Jasper, recently instituted a full ban with a clause related to public consumption sites, yet none are approved as of yet. <clears throat> Edmonton, so far, is the outlier. They have permitted smoking or vaping of cannabis. However, they increased the distance from five meters to 10 meters, smoking or vaping cannabis from a bus stop or the doorway of a public place, window or air intake of a building or patio. And they added a few parks that weren't covered under the provincial legislation. Policy is currently being developed around festivals and public events. So what else? We conducted a public survey earlier this year in my opinion, it did not provide clear direction on allowing or prohibiting public smoking or vaping of cannabis. Got me thinking about what is the draw going to be on policing resources if there's a full ban instituted under the bylaw or simply following provincial regulations. I want to highlight that tonight's presentation is speaking about public consumption, or sorry, smoking or vaping, there's a whole bunch of other things that go along with the legalization tomorrow. So tonight I'm thinking about what's the draw gonna be? To be honest, I'm not sure. I'm not comfortable saying I'm not sure. It's true, it's, it is truly too early to tell if the RCMP or our Town of Canmore Bylaw Services Community Peace Officers will be inundated with calls for smoking cannabis in public. I tried to think about a comparison of a bylaw that's been approved in my time that was even somewhat close. So work with me for a minute, it might be a bit of a stretch. The best comparison I have is the idling bylaw. I get asked the question every single time I'm before you. If we approve this bylaw, what's your enforcement plan? What's the, what sort of resources is this gonna require? We didn't know, we didn't staff up, we didn't, and we received very few calls. It has become more of a public expectation to follow. Granted, the consumption of cannabis is more at the forefront and is far different than idling, but wanted to highlight one example. I also thought about medical users. They're exempt in the proposed bylaw in public places, except hotels and not the provincial regulations. Consistent with other bylaws, if a medical user is found smoking or vaping cannabis, they're required to produce a medical card to a peace officer or a police officer upon demand. So where does all this take me? It leads towards tonight's recommended, or administration's recommendation. So my recommendation is based on, given all of the uncertainty and the newness of the legislation, of the legalization. I'm recommending that we take a more restrictive approach to start and that we loosen it up in the future if there is good reason to do so. <clears throat> Generally don't like starting off presentations like this, but I wanted to highlight one uh, recommended edit and this will point to uh, page 87 of your package. It's page 87, if we're all on the same page, speaks to medical cannabis. So my motion is that council amends section 3.4a by adding the words section 3.1 of between the words two and this, and I'll bring it up so we can follow along. So the intent when I drafted this was person who is entitled to possess cannabis authorized by a medical document issued pursuant to the access to cannabis for medical purposes regulations is not subject to section 3.1 of this bylaw. 3.1 of the bylaw says no person shall smoke or vape cannabis in public place. 
So this gives the authority for medical users to smoke or vape cannabis in a public place. However, it still restricts them for smoking or vaping cannabis in a hotel. So just wanted to highlight that. So the second motion then would be that council give first, second, and third reading of bylaw 2018-24 as amended with my amendment to prohibit the smoking or vaping, vaping of cannabis in public. I have a number of options for you to consider this evening. Uh, they're pretty much in alignment with the options presented at the Cal meeting, but they've changed a little bit. So I'll run through these. One, aligning with the provincial regulation. So no bylaw would need to be approved. However, I'm recommending a, a motion the council direct administration to request authority from the Solicitor General to have section 90.28 of the Gaming, Liquor and Cannabis Act, which prohibits smoking or vaping of cannabis in public places, be added to the town's peace officer appointments so that enforcement of smoking and vaping can be conducted by both the town's bylaw services, community peace officers and the RCMP. So as of tomorrow, if option one is selected, no bylaw needing approval, the enforcement defaults to the RCMP, as it's a provincial regulation. Any tickets that go to court would be a provincial crown prosecutor conducting the prosecution. We would need to request from the Solicitor General's office, who gives us the authority under provincial acts, to add this section on this one specific section that specifically speaks to smoking or vaping of cannabis in public places to our community peace officer appointments. We can go through a little bit of a refresher on what the provincial regulations are. I'm not going to read them verbatim. Essentially, it says cannabis and tobacco will be prohibited in places listed under the Tobacco and Smoking Reduction Act in public places. This is under the provincial regulations, so different than the proposed bylaw. So, any or art are all part of the building structure. Um, so inside this building, inside any of the coffee shops downtown, anywhere where the public has access as of by right or express or implied invitation, common areas of multi-unit residential facilities, patios, pools, etc., group living facilities, outdoor bus or taxi shelters, we have a taxi or a bus shelter behind us, a licensed premises, and a hotel. We put a, just a, an asterisk beside the hotel as a reminder. We were the second municipality in Canada to prohibit smoking in hotel rooms in, in Canada. Um, if we wouldn't have passed that, smoking would have still been prohibited, yet the hotelier could designate smoking rooms and have regulations specific to it. Can't smoke in workplaces. Regardless if the public has access to the building or not, Can't smoke in public places, again, inside where you have the implied uh, consent. Workplaces, a vehicle in which a minor is present, so this is both tobacco and cannabis. Public vehicles, so a bus, taxi, anywhere where a fare is charged. And within the five meters from a door or window or air intake, so within five meters from the window behind Councillor McCullum. Also, cannabis will also be prohibited under the Gaming, Liquor and Cannabis Act, so just cannabis. Any hospital, school, or child care facility property as a whole, so as opposed to five meters, the entire property. In or within five meters of playground, sports, or playing field, skateboard, or bike park. So you can still smoke tobacco there, can't smoke cannabis there. And vehicles, this question came up, it was either Councillor Sanford or Comfort at the last, I think it was Councillor Comfort at the last meeting. Vehicles, yet yeah, there's an interesting piece of wording in the, the Gaming, Liquor, and Cannabis Act that says, unless when being used, the vehicle is a temporary residence. Yeah. So, interesting. Uh, I showed you this map before. So this is the, the provincial regulations that uh, highlights everything that I just discussed. Option number two, <clears throat> restrict smoking or vaping cannabis in hotels and select locations. So smoking or vaping of cannabis, work with me here, would be allowed in public places, so not inside buildings. So sidewalks, Cougar Creek Trail, 
Riverside Trail, et cetera. Um, however, I've included in the package as attachment three, which starts on page 91, an alternative bylaw. First time I've done this. Two bylaws, same number, but an alternative bylaw. And what you will notice is under section 3.1 of the alternative bylaw, it says no person shall smoke or vape cannabis in the areas defined in Schedule B. Whereas, my recommendation, no person shall smoke or vape cannabis in a public place. So what this is saying is areas defined in Schedule B. 3.2 also says no person shall smoke or vape cannabis in a hotel. We'd need to do the minor amendment to 3.4a. What I've included uh, for consideration in Schedule B to try and make this as easy as possible and what I was thinking is, where else would we want to restrict smoking or vaping of cannabis um, if, we didn't, if you didn't do for a full ban? And I was thinking about generally where are kids present? So in areas where it's not a, a schoolyard, it's not near a playground, uh, it's not near a sports field. So a few things that came to mind for me, Quarry Lake, so a sip ahead. Or, sorry, I used Riverside Park as part of the presentation. Uh, Riverside Park was one that jumped to mind for me. Friendship Park, directly behind us. Uh, Quarry Lake, another area. And the only other one that popped, the one thing that really popped out of the public survey, that only, the only one I felt really provided clear direction was the cemetery. So if council chooses to go this route, I have all of the parks in a format similar to the one you see on the slide, so we can do a little bit of work on the fly um, to include those. Included the motions up there if we choose to, if you choose to go that route. Option number three, similar to option number one, uh, implement a full ban and seek public input on consumption sites. So the motions before you. I would suggest we haven't done a, a full public input on consumption sites. Did want to highlight, again, City of Calgary went down this path. Uh, I won't get into the specifics, but it wasn't successful. And one thing that comes to mind for me is thinking about how contentious dog parks were when we were bringing those into the community and how you would make a decision on cannabis public consumption sites. So just to help out when it comes time for making motions, I've included motions for you. So administration's recommendation. Option number one, aligning with provincial regulations. Keeping in mind there's a bit of a disclaimer I didn't share in the first slide, the hotel piece. Uh, would be interesting because tobacco would be prohibited but cannabis wouldn't so we could consider some working on how to work around that. Uh, option number two, restricting smoking vaping in hotels and select locations of which again I have a, a large amount of maps sitting on my uh, flash drive and then implement a full ban and seeking the public input on consumption sites. I'm here to answer any questions you have. Uh, Mr. Michael Orr, our bylaw services supervisor, who's done a great deal of research on this project as well, is here to answer any questions from a uh, bylaw services community peace officer perspective. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Burt. Not, uh, not a complex uh, matter at all, is it? No, not at all. Um, in regards to, to the last option that you suggested for possible consideration was uh, um, directing admin to go out and consult with the or engage with the public at this time to try to determine locations in the public that people would support smoking cannabis or vaping. Um, you and I had a conversation earlier um, along similar lines but not for immediate Impl implementation. So I was asking if uh, if the recommended motion uh, that appears in the uh, agenda package to prohibit the smoking or vaping of cannabis in public should be approved. Um, 
and a secondary motion were to be put forward uh, essentially to allow for a future conversation uh, that you've just described um, with the public. Now that we know, now that we know, because right now we don't know, mm -hmm. in some time in the future after we have some experience, uh, we could then engage it perhaps if council at the time wanted to um, have that engagement, that would be something in the future. Uh, you indicated uh, that, that you thought that would be manageable and to help me draft a, a motion, which if this uh, first motion is successful, I would then plan to put forward. Uh, just wondering if you have any thoughts or comments on how that might play out or whether there, you might see advantage or disadvantage in proceeding under that um, understanding. So the motion we were discussing uh, was directing administration to return in a specified time. Um, so I suggested two years, October of 2020, with a report providing an update on the public consumption ban and a further option should be considered to loosen the regulations based on the information obtained over this time period. I think it, I mean, it's doable to evaluate, assess, um, like you said, I'm, I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. Kind of an interesting time. Um, I don't know what changes will come forward from the federal government within the next year when they were talking about potential changes to edibles or uh, consumption and how those will be adopted by the province, e each province. So. Um, I'm happy to, to evaluate, to provide a report, um, and if further options should be considered, to come back and, and have that consideration. Um, I think there's a lot of work to, between tomorrow and October of 2020, but I would be happy to return at that time. It just occurs to me that in 2020, we'll have perfect vision. Well, if I get glasses, I will, <laughs> yes. That was, uh, <laughs> Oh. I was expecting a cannabis oh. joke tonight, not an eyesight <laughs> joke. Oh, we may get some of those yet. <laughs> so um, I have questions, and, and I'm sure other councillors do as well, or just around, you've actually uh, touched on or spoken about it already at this, this meeting and previously, just around <coughs> enforcement. Um, council's aware that we don't, we won't have much opportunity in this coming budget to add on more resources for bylaw. I mean, that's certainly not out of the question, but it's gonna be a tough by, uh, budget as it stands. So, um, how, how would you see this, uh, I don't wanna ask a question that's pointless, but there is concern around enforcement and what that might look like. So the, the RCMP would be um, uh, enforcing in some parts of the application. So I'm, I'm always leery to answer for the RCMP when they're not here. Maybe what I can do is differentiate between um, public smoking or vaping and everything else. So if we think about impaired driving, um, possessing more than the legal limit, minors possessing cannabis, that would all default to the RCMP. Public consumption can be a hybrid uh, depending on which way we go. So if we have a municipal bylaw, we can draft and approve municipal bylaws so as long as they are not inconsistent with provincial legislation. So in that regard, RCMP can enforce both bylaws, or they have the authority to enforce bylaws and the provincial regulations. Our community peace officers have the authority to enforce bylaws, and if approved by the Solicitor General, the provincial regulations. So our community peace officers would only be enforcing under uh, the public smoking or vaping of cannabis. Not sure if that answers the question, but no, I wanted to try and delineate those two lines. Not sure there is an answer. <laughs> Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Mr. Burt, for your presentation. My question was around um, 
what you were discussing with Mayor Boroman about evaluating in 2020, um, are you saying that we would do this part, th seek the public input on designated consumption sites? No, no, sorry, that, I left that up there to confuse you. Yeah, okay, um, thanks. So no, did. it was option number one, or sorry, administration's recommendation is to full public ban under a bylaw of smoking or vaping of cannabis and Mayor Boroman uh, was suggesting and adding on to that, directing administration to come back in two years with a report on essentially an update as to what's occurred over the past two years, what we've seen, what we've observed, number of things we've been talking about, um, what's the drain on, on resources, what's the drain on um, enforcement resources, what else have we seen in that time and I wouldn't suggest that it would come back with, there will be changes, but there's an opportunity to have further discussion on what have we learned and should we consider loosening the regulations at that time. So are you saying that that's a different conversation from seeking public input to appropriate consumption yes. sites? So what I'm suggesting, and great to clarify this, is do the full ban, but right now, direct me, administration, not just me, administration to seek public input on designated consumption sites. So providing direction right now to say full public ban, but we want to consider public consumption sites not in two years. Okay. Soon. All right. That's Similar what to I what was, Calgary okay. has done. So done. to seek that input now as opposed to waiting. But if you seek the input now, you're not really going to have a handle on the impact that things are having yet, right? So that is correct. Would you embark on that public input right away or would you wait? I would I mean, not, no. I would tally it over time. Okay, so you're not gonna put a survey up on the website tomorrow saying what are your, you know. Nope. I mean, I'm just thinking about the timelines. Yes. We're gonna reevaluate in two years. Yes. Versus ask for input on this right, correct. right away. Um, just don't wanna confuse that's a possible amendment that, that right. I or somebody else may put forward if the recommended motion is successful. Okay, I just wanted to understand mm -hmm. the evaluation process of both of those things. So one is a shorter term evaluation and one would be a longer term evaluation. And one is, that, one is specific, so option number three is specific only to designated consumption sites, whereas the proposed motion is about the impacts of um, the full ban, any proposed changes coming out of the federal government, the provincial government, et cetera, over that two year window. So two totally different uh, pieces of information. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect, thanks, thanks for asking that. the question. Just to add to that, the, I think it's important to clarify that option three is not Mr. Burt's recommendation, it's just an option for council. If especially council was interested in option two, but not certain about where to go with schedule B and what the locations are, that would be one way to get there. But it, it's not what's being recommended. It's just provided to council as another alternative. The question about 2020 is uh, an amendment from council. So they're quite distinct. Quite distinct. Absolutely. Can I just also suggest since you made an amendment on page 87, Yes. Further down under 4.2, there's a bit of a typo, I think. Which section? Uh, 4.2, the second line, which says Schedule A of if this bylaw. Yes. So something got changed there. Just a minor edit. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? You bet. Um, <coughs> did you suggest that B&Bs would be under the hotel? Regulation. So, can B and Bs have offer um, cannabis opportunities on their property, whether it's inside the building or outside the building? Uh, I did not suggest that. So maybe I'll just point to. So, this question came up at the the committee of the whole meeting. Um, so, to further answer that, the provincial. Tobacco and Smoking Reduction Act, in which smoking and vaping and cannabis applies to all the locations listed, includes a hotel. And a hotel under the Act 
is defined as an inn, a guest house, and a bed and breakfast facility. And to take it one step further, we have the smoking control bylaw, which prohibits the smoking uh, of tobacco. So you can't smoke tobacco in a B&B right now. The proposed uh, bylaw includes no person shall smoke or vape cannabis in a hotel. So it would not be allowed in a B&B. Okay, so that's... Okay. Long roundabout answer. Yeah. No. So they're, they're connected in the sense yes. that they're commercial operations? Yes, so two acts and a bylaw are connected to address one piece. And that's the, the tobacco act? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Councillor Comfort. Thanks for your presentation, Mr. Burt. It sounds like you had to really wrap your head around a whole lot of different factors to come up with only three options. Mm -hmm. It feels like it should have been more somehow, but... That would just confuse us more, so. I try and limit it to my recommendation in three, <laughs> as far as I go. So um, I just um, <clears throat> have a couple of questions. Uh, would you say that at the present time, in essence, we have the equivalent of a full ban, given that it's illegal? Yes. And yet, we all know that people, I mean, because I've smelt to, uh, cannabis smoke that people are out there smoking in public what? already. Sorry to alarm you, Your Worship. In fact, but I, it's coincidentally, a thing. I caught a whiff on my way into the council this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, and okay. that people are consuming alcohol in public in certain places, as witnessed by some of our officers' tickets issued. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some some of the things that might change. I can tell you're waiting to see where I'm going with this, but. I'm um, so some of the things that might change are um, the provincial legislation. So I think we would have all been helped if it, they'd made the possibility of, of a, a hashish lounge, you know, a possibility, a place where, because what I'm struggling with is that if you take um, alcohol, if you're an adult, you can go to the bar and you can have a drink and, and then all the other options of consuming it in your home or whatever your hotel room, but you don't have that option with cannabis if you're not if you're not a private property owner. So you can't, you know, there's nowhere to go in essence. So I have a little bit of trouble um, with, it's like cognitive dif dissonance for me. It's like a gong, you know, it's, it's like, okay, it's legal, but you can't consume it anywhere. I have trouble with that. Um, I have trouble with our visitors just dealing with that, so I'm just I'm just taking you through my process as I mm -hmm. work on coming to decision. So, um, what if uh, we, what would increasing the distance from um, doorways and openings and so forth to 10 meters? What would that map look like then? I wish you had asked me that before. I, so I could have done up a map for you. What would that look like? More orange than there. More <laughs> orange. Let me get out a pen. There's a, you know, if you look at the hospital site, right? That's the full hospital. Yeah. A lot of the, the smaller, you know, not big areas, they're going to get incrementally bigger. Okay. Incrementally bigger, so five meters, 15 feet. So if we think about, uh, I'm really bad at measurements, you know, here to the sidewalk, it's definitely not 15 feet right now. 30 feet, probably not. You know, maybe we go to, under provincial regulations, the top of the stairs, close, the bottom of the, and then a little bit beyond the bottom of the stairs, but that still would mean I'm standing on the sidewalk being able to smoke uh, or vape cannabis. So I think where you're headed is what would Edmonton's decision, and keeping in mind they added in a few other locations yes. as well, what would that look like? Um, you know, I think it's, it's as easy as, not as easy, but looking out the window and saying how far would that go? Okay. It would increase it. Uh, so what are we trying to, what would you be trying to accomplish? Downtown, it would likely have an uh, impact on. Um, Cougar Creek Trail, no. Riverside Park, no. 
um, trail going up beside bench lands, no. Outside of private residences, probably not. Uh, outside of the public works building, you know, a little bit farther, but still the sidewalk, still be able to consume it there. Just trying to think of a few, yeah. few locations. I'm just trying to mm -hmm. sort of wrap my head around that. And then um, I had a question about the uh, penalty for the manager of the hotel who would be um, allow, allowing a person to smoke or vape cannabis, mm -hmm. $500 fine. Mm -hmm. What does allow mean? Because the manager may not be aware, may not have given permission to someone to smoke or vape cannabis, but somebody might do it anyway. Would, would the manager then be in line for a fine or would it be up to the... Yeah, the manager could be. I mean, manager is further defined in, um, in the Act, in the Tobacco and Smoking Reduction Act, and I have a specific example about this. So manager means any employer or other person who directly or indirectly controls, directs or is responsible for a place or controls the activities in, that, in the place. Um, so the reason and rationale behind that was I'm the manager of a hotel and I'm going to allow smoking tobacco or I'm going to allow smoking of cannabis in my hotel. So we did have one uh, several years ago when this act came in. We were getting complaints. There was smoking occurring on the property. The manager was allowing that to occur. He was allowing his staff to allow that to occur. It's the manager's responsibility to ensure that it isn't occurring. And the fine amount simply aligns uh, with the fine in the um, smoking control bylaw. Okay. And I think that's... Oh, um, so and a question about the Tobacco Act, provincial. Mm -hmm. um, is it not forbidden to consume tobacco where around children, where children are? I thought playgrounds was Yeah, included. no, so that's, that's kind of an interesting piece, is the Tobacco Reduction Act speaks to... the top five bullets, so public places, so inside buildings, workplaces, vehicle in which a minor is present, so you can't drive down the street with your minor, public vehicle, so bus, taxi, et cetera, within five meters of doorway, it does not speak to consuming or smoking um, tobacco. So you could be, we don't see it, thankfully, but skateboard park, good example, playground, good example, um, so it doesn't prohibit smoking of tobacco. Okay. and. Uh, well, somebody else should go. I've got more questions. Councillor McCallum. Thank you, Your Worship. Am I on? Okay. You're on. And I would point out that that is the hypocrisy in the whole thing, is that the Cannabis Act and the Tobacco Act are not aligned. But anyways, um, uh, I had a question about uh, tickets. Actually, no, I wanted to um, go off Councillor Sanford's question about bed and breakfast. So based on the Tobacco Consumption Act and the Cannabis Act, we would not, we're a bed and breakfast or a hotel or anything like that, uh, are not allowed to have their guests consume or smoke within a room. Are they allowed to go outside? Because that's not considered public property. So would a hotel be able to create a zone on their own property where people could consume cannabis? Much like they would be able to consume tobacco as long as it was within... Uh, so if we do a full ban, mm. no. Okay. Because the full ban... Okay. Or, hang on. Yeah, Let me I know. confer on that. <laughs> it hurts. It's so confusing. Uh, well, this is where it gets... Interesting, right? Because um. I think that that's the, the direction that um, Councillor Sanford, her question was, is that, like, I understand that you can't consume inside a hotel, okay. and I uh, support that completely. Hotel, bed and breakfast, etc. But would they be able to provide an area outside, much like they provide an area sometimes for their guests to consume tobacco. Okay, so give me a second no here. No worries, the, I'll stop the, talking. The um, hamster's moving right now. Um,
could take a short recess. And yeah, I can Mr. answer Burke. that question. I just want to make sure I'm giving you the right no, answer. No, I appreciate as that. I know because it's. It. Yeah, I'm more than happy <laughs> to answer all other questions. All right, and I'll take ask a short recess one. and come back to, to clarify that. Sure. Take a recess. Or do, or do you want me to ask other questions? Why don't we or, keep going? All right. Because then, if I get I any more. more that stumped me, I then can you answer can gather those them on the all recess. together in a basket and go find out how. I think I should be give answered. you an award. You're the, I think, the first person to stump me in <laughs> council. You've known me a long time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, so, in your August committee of the whole presentation, um, you indicated that a total consumption ban would be the most difficult of the three options: option one, two, and three to enforce. Can you explain to me why? And is the why the reason why you made that amendment? Ask me again. You've thrown me off. That question? Yes. In the August Committee yes. of the Whole presentation, you indicated that a total consumption ban would be the most difficult of the three options to enforce. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because it blankets the entire town, so there's a okay. larger area where there's a That's what I thought, but it didn't of, say that. Yes, blankets yes, entire exactly. Town. Great question. Perfect. Um, so how would, and the mayor uh, alluded to this, how would a complaint of public cannabis consumption play out? To our community peace officers. And it would be community police officers that would be enforcing yep. it, or, and the RCMP? So again, I can't speak to the RCMP as to how they would okay, respond to it. Right. I can take a bit of heat off me and defer to Mr. Michael Orr uh, as to how his department would respond okay. to that. So when it would come to bylaw, yeah. that would be the call. Bring, bring. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, we've discussed this in depth, and the way we've looked at it is that if we did get a... Uh, call from the public about cannabis consumption in public, there'd be two main factors that we take into account on our response. The first would be the vicinity of the officer compared to the offense, and the second would be the nature of the offense. Um, for example, if you had a person smoking a single marijuana cigarette up in Three Sisters and the only available officer was way out in Larch, the likelihood that the officer would get there while that person is still consuming is extremely unlikely and the community impact is low. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a possibility we may not respond. Now, however, if you put that same distance between the officers and you have a large number of people in a circle who've been sitting there uh, consuming for 30 straight minutes and don't have, uh, there's no indication that they're gonna stop. They would be napping if that happened. <laughs> just pointing out. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> or eating a vat of chips. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, there, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to be like real. Like that's exactly what would happen. Yeah, um, and it would it would depend on the on the nature of it. Uh, we we do understand the reality of catching someone if there's going to be a 15 to 20 minute response time is extremely low. So the likelihood of response uh, would be low. But um, if the, there was an officer in the direct vicinity, they would respond and uh, you know. Uh, take in part in enforcement actions as we would with any other bylaw. So you would triage, basically, based on the number of requests you have at that moment, the number of officers you have available, and the importance of the request that's come forward. That is a great way to put it, yes. Thank you. <laughs> and to add to that, so we would triage, but we would begin to, to track it. So yes. if we saw a large number of complaints that we weren't able to respond to in a specific location, similar to dogs off leash or idling vehicles. Yeah. That helps determine our proactive enforcement plan and where we need to spend our proactive uh, hours. Cool. Um, in the past, how many tickets have been handed out in the public uh, for smoking tobacco? I don't have an exact number for you. I can tell you it's very low. Uh, I could probably count on one hand in the past year how many times we've actually received a public complaint. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do get feedback from the officers that they do not encounter uh, many smoking offenses whatsoever, you know, within five meters of ventilation and yeah. doorways. Um, it seems that Canmore is a very uh, smoke-free community. I just to went areas. home to Hamilton. Yes, we are. I'm just going to yeah. <laughs> move on to another counselor. And sure, come of back course. Here. Councillor Hillstead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, one, it's probably getting the weeds a little bit, but with regards to the public vehicle, which means a bus, taxi, or other vehicle uh, that members of the public use for a fee, if we went to fare-free transit, 
do we have to put a stipulation in there? Because if it's not a fee, all of a sudden that way that they've worded it kind of goes out the window. And off the top of my head, I'm going to say no, but if we go to Fairfree Transit, I think that's a good thing to investigate and just ensure that we're covered. Yep. And then the other thing is, have we, has there been any movement on if the federal government will be allowing lounges or cafes to happen? Or? I believe that uh, that decision is to come in uh, one year's time from the legalization date, uh, but nothing f absolutely firm at this point. Thank you. Councillor Seeley. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Burt, thank you for your presentation and your recommendation. Uh, just wondering uh, about the two-year time frame. Uh, it seems reasonable to me that we would uh, get some information and uh, what would you hope to learn in that two years? And is there already learnings from other municipalities like uh, California you're aware of? You understand that wasn't Mr. Burt's uh, suggestion initially, so... No, I understand that. <clears throat> yeah. I think there's a number of learnings that would come. So what changes may occur from the federal regulations? How, how are things working in areas, well, the one area so far, um, Edmonton, uh, that's increased the distance. What impact has that had? Uh, how does that compare if a draw on resources? You know, speaking to Councillor McCollum's, how many calls are we receiving? You know, I, I don't know what that's going to look like. What's the impact? What's the community impact? What's the community saying? Um, how does the community feel? I think there's a, a whole rash of questions that I would uh, be sitting down with with a team to to finalize. Um, in terms of other areas or states, to be honest, not a lot of research. However, uh, they have public consumption bans where it's legal. So um, always more than happy to do more research and see what was learned from that. Um, but not really looking, haven't been able to find anywhere else where they've allowed it and what that impact has been. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Seely, I'll just, um, in what's been on my mind in, in thinking about that possibility is, is exactly uh, what we're experiencing right now. There's, there's far more questions than answers. So maybe in some time we'll have more, more answers and can speak about some of these possibilities with um, better certainty. Councillor Mayor? My three questions have been answered. They've been asked and answered. Somebody over there have something to add? No? Councilor McCallum? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so the bylaw that you propose shows that the fine for smoking in public will be at minimum $100. Um, will the fine or the outcome of the fine be different if the individual is caught and charged by the RCMP or by bylaw? Is it the same no matter what? It goes to provincial court? So it depends which... So they, the RCMP can charge under the bylaw. Mm -hmm. They could also charge under the, the act. Uh, to be honest, we were seeking clarification on the fine amount under the act today. And through the various resources, we were unable to obtain that. Where we landed with the fine amount was, I'm fairly confident in saying that I, I believe it will align with the charge for uh, using or consuming liquor in a public place. Which is? Which is $100 plus the victim fine, the, the provincial charges, which is $115. $115. Yes. So they add on, again, the provincial charges okay. to that. Um, and so you've stated that at this point you don't think that there'll be any additional resources uh, required to enforce the bylaw. Did you manage to see what Grand Prairie has done, actually, with their uh, public semi-public ban they've no. actually uh, allowed it in some outdoor instances i'm just reading it now not allowed in public buildings workplaces or public venues not allowed in downtown grand prairie on all streets and avenues including and bounded by 101st ave or 100th avenue between 102nd and 98th street this one is cool not allowed within a 30 meter radius of a recreational fa oh. facility public park parade, outdoor special event, or where children are playing or congregating, 
not allowed in a manner and or proximity that is adversely affecting another person, not allowed where a public sign prohibits smoking. Sounds like a lot of fun to enforce that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think what it does is it puts the onus on the consumer to make sure that, that they're staying out of other people's way, which is interesting and somewhat subjective, but uh, I, I thought yes. it was interesting. No, that, I, I didn't have an opportunity to review that, but I will. Um, you're right, that is very interesting. And you know, Ms. Hyde and I have worked a lot on bylaws and trying to figure out you know, what are we trying to accomplish? How is it clear? And when it comes time in, to enforcing it, how is it clear to the officer, the, uh, the resident or visitor, so they understand what's clearly expected of them? And finally, when it comes time for a prosecution, how does our, our municipal crown prosecutor prosecute that? So there's a number of really interesting sections in there. It kind of but reads more like a nuisance bylaw and a condominium squirm, corporation. Honestly. Yeah. That's what it reads like, is more like a nuisance bylaw. And, uh, and I don't know how you interesting prove some of those, you know, downtown core, oh, easy, right? Put on a map, put on a yeah. schedule, easy, done. Um, in or within 30 meters of kids that were playing, well, that moves. Or where children are playing or congregating. Anyways. Yeah, very um, interesting. And right? I also note that the MD of Bighorn is not putting any conditions in place at all. I haven't seen or heard of any. I asked okay. Councillor Rossfeld this morning. So this truly speaks to, you know, a number of, of questions that I would suggest oh, man, hundreds if not thousands of councillors have faced in the last time. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest, you know, one of the more challenging situations, because um, everyone's doing things differently. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own opinion. Every, you know, people like Grand Prairie come up with something different. Um, you know, my goal is to, my goal is to present what I feel is best. Yep. for the town of Canmore and also present some other options that we would, uh, that would be workable for us as well. I have one last question and mm -hmm. I don't know if you had an opportunity to see the interview on CBC with the Minister of Border Security and Organized Crime as well as um, the Amer Canadian Medical Association um, president. Anyways, it was pretty interesting. Um, and it speaks to how you're gonna collect data to be able to come with recommendations moving forward. So uh, I just have it written down here. In a recent CBC interview with the Minister of Border Security and Organized Crime, Minister Blair was challenged by the interviewer as to why there were not better statistics and studies on cannabis use in Canada. The minister replied that in a prohibitive environment, research has been difficult, if not impossible, in many jurisdictions. How do you do trials or clinical testing when you're talking about an illegal activity is the, what he was quoted saying. So my question is with regards to adjusting the parameters of public consumption in the future, how will your department provide Canmore specific statistics related to consumption in public if the act itself is in its a full state of prohibition in public? So unless we know where the rub is, how do we know how to fix the rub? Very good question. <laughs> I, I think that would also speak to what we were talking about earlier, is give it a couple of years and then we'll know much more. Um, Councillor Comfort? Yeah, I just uh, had a couple of things about, um, so that piece about the, uh, it's illegal to smoke in an automobile unless the automobile, or vehicle, sorry, unless that's being used as a home or as a residence. So that would suggest uh, that someone who is homeless, except for their car, could smoke in their car, could consume cannabis in their car. I would if it's stationary. Yes, I, I believe you're right. Uh, the intent, I'm, I'm assuming the intent behind the provincial legislation was to address you know, traditional RVs or motorhomes, but you're correct. Okay, and then, um, So, hypothetical situation, backyard, private property, homeowners are smoking, consuming cannabis, uh, mm -hmm. vaping, whatever, and that property is immediately adjacent to a trail. 
Mm -hmm. People are going past. They object to the smell. This one reminds me of the, we had complaints about um, fireplaces and chimneys. And backyard and, fire pits. And then, so then it's like, it's, and it's a subjective thing again. Mm -hmm. So are those sorts of um, rubs going to cause a problem for bylaw in enforcement? Because it, technically it's not an offense, right? Because it's a private property owner. Mm -hmm. But they're interfering with the enjoyment of other people too. I think that's why we would be passing a bylaw that provides specific, clear uh, regulations as opposed to, um, you know, a community oh. standard style bylaw that says if someone's doing something on their property that I don't like, interferes with my enjoyment of the property, um, then it would create more of a rub using your language in the bylaw services department because it becomes more subjective as opposed to you know I've got a backyard fire pit there's no fire ban and I can have a fire every night absolutely I want to be a respectful neighbor but I could also go out onto my deck and I mean walk around the community people are either out smoking occasionally or they're smoking cannabis right so same sort of thing so I if the proposed bylaw was passed I would say that it wouldn't create a rub for us great and last last thing was um, if uh, it was clear from the kinds of complaints you were receiving or changes in the law uh, federally or provincially that a return to the bylaw was necessary before that two-year window that would just happen right right I'm not, you, well, we can come back and amend the bylaw at any point um, if it's not working for us or if there's changes that need to be made. So, yes. Thank you. I have one, one last question, at least one last question of my own. In the uh, draft bylaw section 4.8, you notes in the case of an offense that is a, of a continuing nature contravention constitutes a separate offense in respect of each day or part of a day on which it continues. So does that mean it would be considered an offense if the officer um, issued a ticket, walked away, came back in an hour and still going on? So that's a second offense and so standardized language contained within uh, all of the bylaws we've updated in the past 10 years. So similar to you're walking your dog off leash over here, $100 fine. Uh, you're walking your dog off leash over here four hours later, get another fine. Same thing here. So you're here, you get a fine. You know, four hours later, you're in the same spot. You've gone somewhere else. It's another fine. Great. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Sanford. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Would it be onerous to put in a clause saying review annually or is that too frequent? Because there's going to be a lot of changes in the next six months to a year. Um, I would never recommend including a clause in a bylaw that is to be reviewed because we're passing a law. I would, it would be, I would recommend if that was council's direction to do it through a separate motion uh, that requires me to come back. Um, would annually be feasible or is that too frequent? From your perspective? I think an annual review of a bylaw would become onerous, to be honest. Um, Can I just Ms. jump Cottle? in here? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I want to just support what Mr. Bird is saying and, and, and acknowledge, you know, this is new legislation. And so we, we recognize that uh, there's a lot of unknowns and a whole lot of things that are going to change. And so are anticipating that as things unfold, we may need to bring this back to council for changes and updates. But we we don't know. There's a uh, there, you know there's a whole lot that we still don't know. So to be able to predict what a reasonable timeline is, I don't think is something we can do at this point. But but um, you know in terms of council's questions and and concerns, we also need to be looking at what's happening in the community, what's happening in the province, what's happening federally, and we'll be bringing things to council as needed. Um, based on what happens in all those realms. So there's a lot of unknowns, but we, we know it's something that we're going to need to pay attention to and monitor and make up updates and changes to as needed. Uh, but what that time frame is, is 
impossible to predict. Okay, thank you. So, there's no further questions? All oh, right, so I'll, unless you have an answer now, I'll call a short recess. I, I think okay. I know, but I want to call a friend. Call a friend. <laughs> okay, just, just before you do, Councillor Comfort thought of one more question. Sorry, there was one that I thought, um, and maybe I need to bring it as a motion, um, or just to direct a bin to look into permitting for um, events, like, say, the Folk Fest, for an area that, uh, where people could go to toke up for want of a better. I don't know what's the technical term. Is there a technical Smoke term? Smoke or vape canvas? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I so, would hope that we could leave that for yeah. Future. I just I just wondered if it would be useful for for bylaw to have that uh, direction at this point. No, no, that amendment written in it would make their job easier because otherwise they're patrolling the grounds. I'm going to call a short recess, and while you think about that question, and Kay. I understand <laughs> you're asking. So um, as long as you need, five, ten minutes. Sure. Thank you.
Okay, Mr. Rodney. Sir. Call the meeting back to order. So three answers. Okay. Uh, number one, under administration's recommendation of the full ban, smoking would not be permitted on hotel property. Answer number two, if we went with option number one, aligning with the provincial regulations, smoking or vaping and cannabis would be permitted on uh, hotel, did I say hospital first? Sorry, hotel, hotel property. And three, the, the question in regards to smoking or vaping of cannabis uh, at the Folk Fest to be determined uh, once more work is done with gaming and liquor uh, and cannabis regulations similar to liquor permits. Uh, it was pointed out to me that that's adjacent to a school, so it couldn't be on the grounds themselves under this proposal. Well, but we, we need to determined. define, yes, possibly yeah. school property versus town property. That one's a unique yeah. situation. But to be determined. To be determined, yeah. yes. So while you were busy doing that, a couple of councillors had a couple other questions. Councillor Romero. I have a question uh, specifically Cougar Creek area. Mm -hmm were properties back on to the school ground. So as a property owner, you're allowed to smoke on your property, but your property backs on to the school playground. Who trumps who? Or <laughs> it's a really I think we have question. to assume the, the enforcement, mm -hmm. whoever it is will have some discretion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you're on your own property, yep. even though it may be within whatever the mm -hmm. meter of playground is. So there's got to be some discretion. Di discretion, there. yes, and technically, no person. This is, comes out of the Gaming, Liquor, and Cannabis Act. No person may smoke or vape cannabis on any hospital property, school property, or child care facility property. The prescribed distances, the five meters speaks to playgrounds, sports fields, playing fields, skateboard parks, et cetera. So it's a little bit of a gray area, but if there isn't a sports field directly adjacent to it, again, some discretion would be used, but um, I don't think that, yeah. You know, Go on the front porch. I, I think we'd be okay. <laughs> Sorry? I don't We're think okay. it would be applicable. You and Phil will be okay. Don't <laughs> I don't smoke though. <laughs> if I have to come talk to you. <laughs> oh, oh, of course, wink, wink. Councillor McCallum. I have more questions. I'm very sorry. So, uh, I, um, provincial land. So, I believe I read that uh, provincial parks and so on and so forth, the province hasn't made any decisions with regards to cannabis on, is it provincial parks or is it provincial land? I don't believe they've made a decision on either. Okay. So, f but federal campgrounds are a yes? what I read today. And then what about Lake Louise? I, I don't know how to answer about Lake Louise. Well, so. because it's not in the, obviously, Banff Town site. It's mm -hmm. far, far away from there. Mm -hmm. But it's not a campground, and it's in a provincial or federal park. I'm thankful we're not making a decision yep. for so I'm, not I'm just better. trying I'm to understand. Sure. No, I'm, well, I am, we, we I am brought well. the discussion about neighboring jurisdictions into the discussion, so that's why I'm asking the some questions. The we're being asked to prove mm -hmm. is silent outside of the town of Camel. So I understand that. Matter. I was just looking for information with mm -hmm. regards to what our adjacent mm -hmm. jurisdictions had decided since they've been brought into the argument as well mm -hmm. as into the discussion to um, support option three. So okay. I haven't conducted the research in terms of okay. Lake Louise. And then the other question I, uh, so, I, I got completely confused, and it's been sort of explained to me, but I'm still confused. So, there's there is a there's there isn't a follow up motion, or uh, Mayor Barman I'm, may be putting a follow up motion forward. Can I allow Mayor Please. Barman to answer that? Somebody's phone is binging. Do you mind turning it, oh, off? Turning it off? Yeah, thank you. Usually, that's fifty dollar fine for the food bank. Just so you know. <laughs> We're not laughing. So Mr. Burt has presented a, a number of um, motions, mm -hmm, the first of which is recommended. Yes. If council approves well, that recommended motion or any of the others, 
I would put forward um, a motion to effectively uh, give it this all some time so that the entire community is able to assimilate and we can actually see how it plays out and, and have uh, uh, administration come back in a period of time, essentially with a report and their experience and here's where the weaknesses are, here's where the strengths are and then at that time council could uh, perhaps uh, initiate a, a public uh, engagement process to loosen the bylaw if it was very strict. Okay. That's all I'm thinking. So then what were you, what was you were speaking to coming back in the near term to have a, I'm confused. That's where okay. I got confused. Sorry, sorry for confusing you. That's okay. It happens often. <laughs> I was suggesting an option similar to, I was suggesting an option to say essentially if you're uncomfortable with approving a full ban without having public consumption sites, that I don't feel we've properly received public input on designated consumption sites. So if that was something that council desired, let's do a full ban, but we wanna look at specific sites, I'm not comfortable presenting options for that right now without getting public opinion. Okay. Is that? So that was like the, that, but that was, um, that's part, not part of your motion though, or part no, of the no, recommendation. No, no, these are, maybe to confuse matters again, I, I tried to put up motions for, I know. this is my recommendation. This is, then there were three other options. I was hoping to make it easier if council chose to go to a different option, the proposed motion. Okay. So this is administration's recommendation, full ban. Okay, thank you. For the last, well, thank you. Thanks for the questions. So, if there's no further questions from members of council or administration, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. Um, you had noted in your presentation there that the draft bylaw that was in the agenda needed to have a, an amendment made and yeah, so when I put the motion forward, it will be to, well, I'll, I'll move the council give first reading to bylaw 2018-24 as amended uh, in, in the meeting to prohibit the smoking or vaping of cannabis in public. So that, then looking to the municipal clerk, the amended motion would be reflected, right? And uh, I'll speak in, in support of the motion uh, as council will know and, and others, when we first started talking about this some time ago, I was, um, all of us were, were struggling with what's the right answer for town of Canmore. And for some time I personally was thinking less restriction would be uh, the direction I would prefer rather than more restriction. Uh, but I've, and then I got up on the fence, <laughs> and I was perched firmly on the fence for a long time, and, and I'm off the fence, and now I, I believe uh, for a number of reasons that uh, applying more stringent restrictions as is recommended in, in the report is the way to go for the town of Camor. Um, and, and this discussion this evening, I think, is strong argument in support of that. There, there's so much that isn't known. There's far more that's not known locally, regionally, provincially, and federally. Uh, so I think it behooves us to, to move into this with some care. Um, cannabis will be legal in the country, and I think that's, uh, that's a good decision on the part of the federal government. But uh, where it's consumed is, is been left to municipal governments to decide. Honestly, I, I think senior levels of government should have been stepping out and making those decisions as well. Uh, what, what's resulting is a hodgepodge, so I don't know how a traveler is gonna know what the regulation is depending on where they are that day. Regardless, um, in the last, uh, or three months, I've 
heard from a number of people, I'm sure the rest of council has as well, uh, that are concerned about how this may play out in the community. I've heard from people in the healthcare uh, community, the primary care network and, and others in the medical community that are uh, encouraging council to take the harm reduction approach, which uh, loosely translated means take care, move carefully and, and understand the impact of what's happening societally. As well, uh, I think the contradiction that, it, that exists or could exist um, uh, between the, the ability to, to consume smoke cannabis or vape cannabis publicly when you can't drink alcohol, there, there's a, a disjunct there that, that I I agree with the number of people in the community. It, that doesn't make sense. Uh, I've heard from a number of parents of children who are concerned about what their young kids may take from uh, being exposed to well, in the park or whatever, uh, seeing people smoking cannabis and, and how the kids will respond to that. And, of course, it's, it's up to a parent to educate, raise their children, but we don't know what the, uh, the impact will be to, to people just moving about the town. When I think about my own personal habits, I walk home from this building, usually through Riverside Park, and often in the summer months, there's a number of young people there that are enjoying the afternoon and uh, doing some slack lining or playing the guitar or whatever, and occasionally I'll catch a, a whiff of, uh, of <laughs> cannabis. And it doesn't bother me a bit, I, I don't care. But I can understand how it might be different if, if um, Riverside Park, I don't know, turned into um, a gathering place for, for a number of uh, young adults who are you know, legally smoking in the park, it might be a different experience for me. So for those reasons and a number of other reasons, I think uh, it's the best decision for council at this time to move into this brave new world with some trepidation and uh, approve the um, bylaw to prohibit smoking or vaping of cannabis in public. I look forward to hearing other councillors' discussion. Councillor Seeley. Thank you, Your Worship. I too will support this, uh, this motion. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, emails, phone calls, uh, discussions with, uh, with community, and there's some real uh, community fears out there at the, at the moment, and uh, they all uh, have expressed uh, this, uh, this motion prohibit uh, the smoking of vaping or cannabis in public. And uh, I think a tight restriction from the onset with adjustments later makes sense. Uh, we don't know what we don't know, so let's, uh, let's learn a little bit about it and uh, take a look a couple years down the road. So I will support this motion. Thank you. Who was it that said we don't know what we don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Just said it. Okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, that was it. That guy in the States. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Worship. Um, well, I'd have to agree with much of what you said. I will support this motion. Um, when we first went into this, it seemed like there should be lots of options. There should be lots of things we can do. And there were. <laughs> but having to bring this um, substance in line with the Tobacco Act and the uh, the use of alcohol, um, it overlaps both of those in a lot of unfortunate ways. And um, the characteristics of cannabis um, are much like alcohol and smoking, and the unpleasant part of both of those things is part of cannabis, unfortunately. Um, I've heard from a lot of community members that we've made great inroads and strides in reducing tobacco usage in most places around our community for sure. And they wouldn't want to see us go backward on that. So normalizing smoking by bringing into the public realm 
whatever you are smoking, um, sort of puts us back, you know, sets us back in that regard. And, and I think there are serious health concerns um, around smoking and secondhand smoke. Um, the fact that people who are exposed to secondhand smoke of cannabis versus secondhand smoke from tobacco could have other indications is, is something to consider. Um, and I just don't think that I want to be passing people on a hiking trail when I'm out getting fresh air and inhaling the smoke from cannabis because those people are in close proximity to me. So I'm in support of the full ban for many of the reasons that were outlined this evening. Thank you. Councillor Mera. I too will support the motion um, in the spirit of not knowing what we don't know. And I think we're naive to think that it's already not going on. I don't think those people are really going to change their habits, whether it's legal or not. I think the same ones, we're not inconveniencing them, I don't think, as they're still out now at certain times and being respectful of each other. And I hope that continues. So for that, I will support this for many other reasons. Councillor Hillstead. I will also be supporting this motion. Um, it is a little unfortunate that we don't have cafes or lounges available yet, but that's not up to us. That's up to a different level of government. So until they can figure those things out, it'll come back to us at that time and we can possibly relook at this again. But for now, I think that it's our safest option just to get our feet wet and see how it goes. Thank you. Councillor McCallum. Um, so, I have a bit of a spiel. Uh, um, as we all know, the Government of Canada, as part of their platform in the last election, committed to the legalization of cannabis and controlling access to the product, getting it out of the hands of youth, freeing up the courts, as well as dealing directly with organized crime element of cannabis are some of the reasons for this commitment. As a result, otherwise law-abiding cannabis users let out a collective sigh of relief, I'm sure as they have been hiding for decades, fearfully of being treated as criminals. I think we compare cannabis consumption to that of alcohol and tobacco when it's a convenient argument. Uh, I would like to argue that as much as it is similar, it is completely different and therefore should be analyzed on its own. I understand and respect the concerns of residents that allowing public consumption could normalize the act of consuming cannabis and smoking, which could have negative impacts on underage youth. And this is the very group of people that we're trying to keep cannabis out of the hands of. But why is it then okay for the consumption of alcohol to be normalized? Why can a child walk up and down Main Street on any warm day and see people with their children at their side consuming alcohol and effectively normalizing another legal drug? And why with the amount of issues our local AHS addictions office has with the abuse of alcohol have we not engaged in that community discussion yet and instead are demonizing and stigmatizing those that want to responsibly consume cannabis. I was quoted in the paper recently, which I've taken a lot of flack for, um, that a complete public ban could have the effect of treating renters as second class citizens. And I have had time to reflect and read more information provided to me that it is actually not renters, but those living in multifamily housing that will not be treated the same as those living in single family dwellings. The recent federal census states that of our approximately 4,700 dwellings in Canmore, 2,140 are described as single family. This means that more than half the households in Canmore will be potentially unable to consume a legal controlled substance based solely on their housing choice. And finally, I would like to speak to enforcement. There are many, many priorities in our community that require a bylaw or RCMP presence, and depending on which Facebook cookbook group you look at, enforcement is either doing too much or not doing enough. I believe, I'd like to say I think you're doing a great job. Um, I believe that when we pass laws that are unenforceable or we do not have the resources to enforce, we undermine public confidence in both the decision makers and those that are employed to enforce those decisions. And much like our human wildlife interaction philosophies, which restrict recreational use in one area yet provide opportunities for people to recreate responsibly in others, we cannot just tell people they cannot do one thing in one area without providing an alternative. We have provided cannabis consumers with no alternative and the result will they will do it anyways. I had considered trying to make amendments because you guys know I love amendments. I'm a big fan of amendments. 
um, but found it too difficult to try to do so without um, the feedback that we had received in the initial survey. And I was also worried that on-the-fly amendments might have unintended consequences that might impact our youth. It is my wish that administration come back in six months with recommendations so that there are alternatives provided to Council to consider for public consumption and as a result, for the reasons I've outlined, I will not be able to support the bylaw as it is currently written. Councillor Comfort? Uh, yes, for all of the reasons that Councillor McCallum has already eloquently stated, um, I will also not be able to support the bylaw. I don't think it's the bylaw that we need. And um, there's a lot that we don't know. I think it needs to come back a lot sooner than two years from now because there will be so many changes that it will become ineffective. It will, will just be invalid. So for those reasons, I cannot support this bylaw. Any further discussion on the motion? See none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried with Councilor McCallum and Comfort in opposition. We'll then move the Council give second reading of bylaw 2018-24 prohibit the smoking or vaping of cannabis in public. Is there a discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carry with councillors Comfort and McCallum in opposition. And I will then move the council give third reading to the bylaw 2018-24. Oh yeah, so I'll seek leave from council to go to third reading of the bylaw. Those in favor? This is good. It has to be jerks. <laughs> okay. It won't be a jerk. I have a question again. I won't be a jerk. <laughs> okay. Uh, seek leave from council to go to third reading of the bylaw. Those in favor? Opposed? Uh, so I'll now give, move the council give third reading to bylaw 2018-24 to prohibit the smoking or vaping of cannabis in public. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried with Councilor McCallum and Comfort in opposition. And then I will put forward the, uh, a motion that I've been talking about earlier, or I'll ask Ms. Hyde to put it up. So the motion of the Council directs the administration to return in October 2020 with a report providing an update on the public cannabis consumption ban and if further options should be considered to loosen the regulations based on the information obtained over this time period. Uh, and we've talked a lot about this. I don't think I need to talk too much more about what informs that, uh, that motion. The time period, whether two years is, is right or 18 months is right or 10, 12 months, I don't know. But I really believe we need to give this some time to percolate in the community and, and understand if any of the concerns that, that, that have been expressed in the community are, um, well, what the reality is. So uh, I think a two-year window is not unreasonable. And I'll uh, look to council to discuss that motion. Councillor McCallum, did you have, oh, just one sec. CAO has a something. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I, I'm wondering if you would um, potentially consider uh, changing one word instead of return, and just thinking of this from an administrative um, flexibility and um, uh, our ability to meet this motion, but if you, exchange the word in, in October to by October 2020, then, you know, if we have information by October sure. 2019 or by yep. then. I'm fine with that um, slight amendment. Councilor McCallum. I have nothing to say to this. Well, I would like to propose an amendment, but do you want to this amendment? Yes. Okay, an amendment to the amendment. Is uh, that it be Sorry, made. Sorry, no, this is a motion. Your motion. You want to propose a, an, amendment an amendment to the motion. Is that happening now, or would you prefer council to discuss this motion no, as it we'll, stands we'll first? No, we'll hear your amendment. 
I'd like to change the date to be May of 2019. In time for tourist season for next year, you speak of confusion amongst our visitor population. Might be better to have that conversation a little sooner than a little later. Two years seems pretty unresponsive. Yeah. Um, I won't be able to support that amendment. Um, six months or whatever that is is nowhere near enough time to, I think, to really get a handle on, on what we're talking about. So I, I wouldn't support um, that amendment. Anybody else speaking to Councilor McCallum's amending motion? Councilor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think what I heard administration say is that they will come back to us when there's significant changes. And bringing back recommendations in May 2019, I, I agree, I don't think that's enough time um, to determine what the impact on the community is and how future legislation from different orders of government is going to affect our decision. So I won't support the amendment. Other discussion on Councilor McCallum's bending motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question on the amendment. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions to be with Councilor McCallum in support. Back to the primary motion then, which is on the overhead, returned by October 2020. Is there further discussion on that motion? Councillor Comfort. Um, I could support this motion with uh, an assurance that if there is substantial um, change in legislation or societal, societal um, conditions or our experience as a community, that this would happen a lot sooner than October 2020. So that's what I'm looking for from it, Ben. I'll remind Councillor that at any time, Council can direct the administration to do that work. We don't have to wait until whatever time is selected in this motion, but through so this. So my, my understanding is that um, admin would be proactive in that by directing our attention to things that perhaps we don't know. Sure. And I think that tweak to the motion helps with that certainty. Yes. I mean, by October, that could be at any time. Okay, I'll support the motion then. Councilor McCallum. I won't be able to support this motion, Your Worship. It's unresponsive to the public concerns, in my opinion. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried with Councilor McCallum in opposition. Generally, we take a short break at 7. Does Council want to do that, given we just had a short break a little while ago? 7.30. Everybody good with that? Moving on then to item F4, Committee Establishment Bylaws. Ms. Hyde. And just before Mr. Burt and uh, his pals slip out, thanks for the work. It's been a laborious, a difficult piece of work for you. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Hyde. Are we ready? Yes, go. <laughs> uh, this isn't exci as exciting, I guess, as <laughs> the cannabis bylaw. Uh, Super exciting. <laughs> I know, and you have to make nine, or no, 12 motions. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Today, I'm uh, coming to you with a request that we pass uh, three bylaws to establish existing committees. And the reason for this is, uh, over time, these committees were passed um, either by bylaw, or I mean, either by a council resolution or in the case of the TP Town Task Force, by a policy. But the MGA is, is clear that uh, council needs to use a bylaw if they're establishing committees. So this is really administration going back and making sure that uh, we're complying with the MGA. The second reason is uh, we've been working quite hard on uh, standardizing all our committee 
bylaws so that we hit all the marks that are required in the MGA, such as meeting notification and what's included in our meeting records. So it's a bit of a template that we're using now for all of our committees. And because of the way these ones were established, some had it, some didn't. So it's really a matter of introducing some consistency. So there's no intent uh, from administration at this time to recommend any changes to the actual terms of reference, the, the mandates or the, or the um, authorities of these committees. It's, it's uh, simply to get them into a bylaw format and address some of the consistency issues. That is my presentation. It's as simple as that. Um, and, and in the uh, drafting of the bylaws, there hasn't been any change at all from the intent of the terms of reference or anything else? Right? No. Yeah. Councillor Hillstead. Just one small question, I think. Um, under uh, meeting records 9.3, it says questions of debate shall be recorded in council committee meeting minutes. So are these all technically council committees or should it just be committee minutes? It's just one Where are word. you, sorry? In, uh, under meeting records 9.3. Mm -hmm. So that's in the heliport monitoring. I think it's in multiple All ones. of them? Yeah. It might just be a template thing, so I wasn't sure if it needs to be council committee meetings or if it should just be committee meetings. Well, I think we've defined committee in each bylaw, right? So in the heliport bylaw, monitoring committee means the heliport monitoring committee. Yeah, it's just the fact that it says recording council committee meetings, and so I just... I don't see where you're... Oh, I see. It's yeah. a, like a typo. Sorry, I was looking in 9.2. Yeah, it shouldn't say that. That's okay. a, that's, that's so a typo. Sorry. I believe it says in all of in them. In all three of them? I think it's just I'll make that adjustment. That's a good catch. My God. Yeah. I'm impressed you read them all. Thank you for reading them. Good job. That's what we're paid to do. <laughs> Press wasn't here to hear that. That's good. Oh, all of our viewers at home know. What? I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. The Counselor, press isn't here for my committee uh, yeah, really. bylaws. Well, we'll wait till she's back to, to call, call the votes. That's okay. Yes, uh, um, Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I did notice that actually, but I thought that they were council committees, but. Well, they are, we have, but it's not we have consistent a, right. with the language. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're on the heliport bylaw right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, sure. Under 4.3, I think there's a typo under B as well. Um, and there was probably a insertion. The, commi the committee's determination of whether or not the Alpine is operating in compliance. Oh, it, right. it probably yeah. said the helicopter company before, but then they inserted. So it should be Alpine helicopters? Yes. Does that make sense? I will make that adjustment. Okay. So I think there was just a generic term in there that got replaced with. Okay. Thank you. Company name. Mm -hmm. And that was all. I guess to that point, should we name the operator in the bylaw? The the bylaw is directly, or the committee, I should say, is mandated in the agreement that the town has with Alpine Helicopters. Okay, right. Yeah. So it's in terms of agreement with that specific company. Yes. Any other questions, discussion? See none, thanks very much. Thank you. Now there's a bunch of motions coming forward. You better get back to your station. <laughs> You don't want to miss one of these. <laughs> I'll then move that council give first reading to Heliport Monitoring Committee Establishment Bylaw 2018-18. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor, opposed, motions carried unanimously. I'll move that council give second reading to the Heliport Monitoring Committee Establishment Bylaw. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. I'll seek leave from council to go to third reading of the Heliport Monitoring Committee Establishment Bylaw. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried. And I'll move the council give third
Third reading to the Heliport Monitoring Committee Establishment Bylaw 2018-18. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. We'll then move the council give first reading to the Public Art Committee Establishment Bylaw 2018-19. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. Move the council give second reading to the Public Art Committee Establishment Bylaw. Discussion? Call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. I'll seek leave from council to go to third reading of the bylaw. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. And I'll move the council give third reading to Public Art Committee Establishment Bylaw 2018 19. Discussion? Seeing none, call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. And I'll now move the council to give first reading to the TP Town Task Force Establishment Bylaw 2018 20. Is there discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. Move the council to give second reading to the bylaw. Discussion on the motion? See none, call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. Seek leave from council. Go to third reading of the bylaw. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. And I'll seek leave, or I'll move the council give third reading to the TP Town Task Force Establishment Bylaw 2018 20. Discussion on the motion? See none, call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. Whew. Okay, moving on then to item G1, request for an adjustment in 2018 property taxes. Ms. Dalrymple. Hey, uh, good evening, Your Worship, members of council. I'm here before you with the taxpayer's request for a reduction to their property taxes as they relate to the tourist home personal use designation. In the case of this tax rule, number 20786, the primary owner of the property suffered a serious illness requiring a sudden operation and recuperation time out of town. Uh, this event and the recovery time for the illness resulted in he and his wife missing the uh, annual filing deadline. They had previously filed the personal use declarations uh, each year from 2013 to 2017 since the Tourist Home Personal Use Program became available through bylaw 2013-01. Administration's recommendation is to uphold the 2018 property taxes as assessed on tax roll number 20786 as they were applied correctly per the tourist home bylaw. Alternatively, due to the exceptional circumstances well beyond the control of the owners, council could grant the property owner's request and direct administration to assess and tax roll number 20786 as a tourist home personal use uh, property for 2018. Uh, if council were to do so, the financial impact would be a little over $5,600 of municipal taxes not collected, while the refunded um, education and seniors requisition amounts can be recovered by the town in subsequent years. Administration did not recommend this alternative as council's bylaw was applied correctly. And of course, I welcome any questions that you may have for me. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's something that you would normally do in the course of the work, your work, but did, did you um, look into their um, statement that, that the serious illness had uh, occurred and that they were in fact recuperating out of town? Do you know that? Uh, no, I have no evidence of that. Uh, it was first brought to my attention by, um, this is a, a senior couple, and it was first brought to my attention by their, um, their uh, adult daughter uh, who came in rather distressed trying to sort of help out and sort out the situation. Um, so I explained to her the process um, which she brought back to her parents um, and, uh, and then subsequently followed uh, followed the process to um, to communicate with us and, and make the request to council. Councillor McCallum. Thank you, Your Worship. Do you can you let us know were they on the tips program? Um, 
I am not sure. I would have to look at that. Yeah. Thank you. That would be good to know. Yeah. Good to know now or in the future? <laughs> well, uh, now actually it would uh, be good to know because it actually speaks to intent. Okay. I can go take a look at that. Okay. Then maybe I will call a short break right now. And um, we'll hold on. Oh, I have, I have no other questions. You're not going to make me run up and down ten times, no, are you? No, sir. Let's get them all. <laughs> uh, unless other counselors have questions, we could ask them now. I think that's the only question. Okay. I can get that momentarily. So we'll call a five-minute break. Or however long it takes. Yeah, Ms. it Dalvin shouldn't be much longer than back. that. Okay, super.
So calling the meeting back to order, uh, Mrs. Dale Rumpel. Uh, yep, so in response to your question, uh, Councillor McCallum, uh, no, they are not on tip. They do pay annually uh, in advance of the deadline each year. Any other questions? I think we said no before the break, but thanks very much for your report. Then uh, at this point, I will put the uh, recommended motion on the table that Council uphold the 2018 property taxes as assessed on tax roll number 20786. And I'm going to speak against this motion, uh, for which, I mean, with reasons that I'll speak to, but um, just uh, an observation or a note for Council, if, if this motion should fail, uh, there would have to be another motion uh, giving administration direction. And um, Ms. Hyde does have uh, another motion prepared to go up if this motion fails. So uh, generally, um, I can't remember any other time that I've supported a request like this. Council typically upholds the uh, property tax as, as assessed, uh, as recommended by administration. But in this case, I'm, I find myself believing that this couple fully intended to uh, file the declaration uh, at the appropriate time. They have a clear record of having done so for five years or whatever. And um, I, I, can, I can certainly understand how a serious health issue could drive that right out of their minds. And then next thing they know, they get the tax bill in July. It's for a lot more than they're used to paying. So uh, great consternation. So uh, in this case, I will vote against the, the recommended motion. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I would be inclined to support the recommendation and uphold the tax bill, mostly because people with tourist home zoning have a very enviable position of being allowed to rent their home out. And the fact that they missed the deadline this year actually gives them a revenue, revenue tool to recover that amount of tax if they so choose. Because they have chosen not to rent their home out, that's their prerogative. But in this situation, they missed the deadline, so essentially they're, they have opened themselves to the opportunity to rent their home for the rest of the year. Uh, if they want to go back to signing the declaration for the following year, I believe they can. But this is a revenue tool, and this is an enviable option for them to rent out their space. So. I can't uphold the, uh, I will uphold the recommendation to use the tax. Just to debate your, your point, Councillor, uh, I wouldn't see that as an enviable tool, frankly. I, I would find it um, incredibly uh, distressing to feel I had to pack up my home, particularly if I was older, which I'm not, pack up my home and find a renter and move out and, and I don't see that in this situation that's an enviable option. So I, I would disagree with your, um, with the point that you've made. Councillor Hillstead. I tend to agree with the mayor in this situation. Um, there is a clear history that they choose to declare personal use and it just seems like very bad circumstances that they missed it. I don't think they were trying to do it on purpose or anything. I think it was a true, just unfortunate event. And they have a history of always choosing to go personal and, and as stated, they pay in advance of the deadline. So they want to pay their taxes. It's just, they would like to use it for personal use. So I will not support this motion. Councilor Comfort. Uh, I will support the motion the recommendation from admin. We've had other instances where people had very reasonable excuses why they missed the deadline. We had other ones that were totally, I just missed the deadline. And um, I think that 
in order to be consistent in our decisions and for people to take it seriously, and we have to uphold this. So I will support the motion. Councilor McCallum. Uh, I too will support the recommended motion, and I understand uh, your perspective, your worship, and I respect it. I, I guess that in past when we have waived, um, waived uh, the uh, penalties, we've been given specific um, proof as to the uh, situation that the taxpayer was in. And unfortunately, um, and, I, and I can see that the attachments that have had um, personal information re, re, um, removed, which is uh, the way it's supposed to be, but I, I think that in past, well, I don't think, I know in past, when we've made decisions to waive uh, the penalties, we've done so based on proof provided us from the applicant. So unfortunately, I will, well, fortunately, I will uphold the, the recommendation of administration. Councillor Seeley. Thank you, Your Worship. I uh, really struggled with this one, but it really jumped out at me that there's uh, extenuating circumstances. Normally, I would uh, lean to uh, uphold uh, something like this, but I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, uh, I can't in this case. Uh, the, the, they, they have good history of paying. I think the intent was to pay. And to Councillor Sanford's uh, point, uh, it is an opportunity, but it isn't one for them. So. Uh, I don't think they would exercise that. It is there if, uh, if it's uh, defeated, but I would, uh, yeah, I'm siding with uh, not, uh, not supporting this, and hopefully the next motion would be uh, personal use for 2018. Councilor McCallum looks puzzled by something there. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, the way some members of council are speaking, it's like they have personal knowledge of this family or this household. You're speaking as if you are have crawled into their minds and you know exactly their intent. I'm just trying to understand if maybe I missed something at some point, that's all. No, nope. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mara. <laughs> um, I think we could use a little bit of the daughter coming in in, in distress as a little bit of evidence, um, looking after her senior parents who have obviously been in a health-related uh, issue. Um, and for eight years, there's a history of them always paying on time and never being used as a rental property. So for that reason, I will not support the recommendation. Further discussion on the motion? Debate? In which case, I'll call the question. Those in support of the motion, and those opposed, Motions defeated with Councillor McCallum, Sanford, and Comfort in support. So, recognizing that we do have to give direction to administration, I'll ask Ms. Hyde to put a, an alternate motion on the overhead. Did we ever get the uh, camera back online, or is that Gonzo? All we've got left is the the press? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, it looks like there's a problem with the YouTube channel, or YouTube itself, I'm not sure, but uh, IT is recording the meeting still, even though it's not streaming, and we should be able to post it tomorrow. Great, thanks very much. Uh, where am I? Oh yes, the motion. So at this point I'll move the council grant the property owner's request and direct administration to assess tax roll number 20786 as a tourist home personal use property for 2018. And I don't feel the need to speak at length to that motion. I've spoken about my perspective on this particular issue. As a follow up, it may be worth suggesting to the property owners that they go on tip and possibly avoid future <laughs> situations. Okay, yeah. Tip wouldn't have mattered, would it? Uh, okay, so motion's on the table. Discussion on that motion. 
for discussion, debate. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried with Councillor Sanford, Comfort and McCallum in opposition. And uh, we'll move on then to item G2. The, uh, thanks for bringing that report and recommendation. Thanks, that was the last meeting. Ooh. Wow. Wow. She goes out with the boss. <laughs> Item G2 Olympic and Paralympic Athlete Village Borrowing. Ms. DeSoto. Thank you, Mayor Borman, members of Council. Um, I'm before you today to discuss potential options for Athlete Village funding related to the um, 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games bid. So as Council's aware, in a, in a few weeks' time, you'll be asked to make a decision on whether or not to support that bid. Uh, and integral to that decision is understanding how we will be able to fund some of the projects that will uh, be related to the games and be delivered in Canmore. So as a reminder, uh, we've talked about the roles that Canmore will have as uh, the mountain host, and there's five of them. So we'd be the developer of and host of the Athlete Village, host community for the biathlon and cross-country skiing uh, events, deliverer of essential services, provider of culture and celebration opportunities, and the medal ceremony and village host for the Paralympic Games as well. But specifically today we're talking about the host of the Athletes Village and what that would mean for us. So um, quick overview again about the scale and scope of the Athlete Village. The proposal is to use the land in the Palliser area that's owned by CCHC and it's shown on that little side map there as block six, the large trapezoid type parcel. Uh, it would be used to construct a 1200 bed, 242 unit village. And then post games, it would be repurposed to perpetually affordable housing or PAH. And the breakdown of the 240 units is proposed to be 90% owned and managed by CCHC, or 218 units, and 10% as a athlete coach's housing legacy, uh, 24 units would be uh, owned and managed by Windsport or other similar legacy organization. So the opportunity to achieve a sizable legacy of affordable housing of this nature, you know, wouldn't be available to us uh, typically uh, if we were to do this on our own and not through the Olympic Games. And it certainly would bring us closer to our uh, comprehensive housing action plan target of achieving 1,000 perpetually affordable housing units. So uh, I think it's certainly worth consideration on, on how we could deliver that. As part of the bid process, there's a number of guarantees that we're being asked to sign or various governments are being asked to sign and specifically Canmore is being asked to sign a guarantee related to the delivery of the village. And so uh, along with that, they'll come costs. Um, there's been uh, some budget estimates and uh, put together by the Bidco consultants in consultation with both town administration and CCHC administration. And so the cost of uh, delivering the athlete's village is proposed to be funded by municipal contributions PAH unit sales and uh, the host co or the the company the corporation that will deliver the games we're calling host co um, a contribution uh, or as they like to call it a subvention and we'll get into the the details of what that would look like so this is a copy of the table that's in your report and I I'm going to quickly review it uh, but I I have another slide that I think might be easier to understand and, and a bit more intuitive. So happy to, to explain more. I, I understand that some people had difficulty understanding this, uh, this table. Um, so let me give you an uh, attempt at, at explaining it. There's um, three 
contributors, or two, sorry, two overall contributors to the overall cost of the village. And the overall cost of the village uh, is shown here um, where my cursor is at $116 million. And basically are, there are two contributors, the town, the muni and this is uh, our town column, and the host corporation, and this is the, the host co-column. The CCHC column here um, is essentially, those costs are, are flow through to be essentially funded through the sale of the PAH units and the subvention from the host corporation. So the town's contribution of 10 million is made up of the $6 million in uh, land costs. There's offsite levy costs of approximately $2 million and another $2 million in associated municipal infrastructure projects related to the flood mitigation and the pedestrian overpass in the area. The host coast subvention, and this is where you have to stick with me on this one, um, it's made up of this $5.5 million in this column here, which covers some of the um, land development costs that are associated with the Olympic overlay on the adjacent parcel of land to the CCHC parcel. Um, and uh, it's that 50 or 5.5 million plus the, and I'll get my cursor on that one, I'm using my left hand here, but this 29.5 million, um, which is the difference of uh, what the construction costs are and the what we'd be able to sell all the units for. Uh, so the host coast subvention includes what they're calling a contribution to affordability of housing in Canmore. Um, and then in addition to that, you add the $7 million uh, to purchase the 24 units for the sport legacy, and you come up with a total host coast subvention of $42 million. I have another table that I think explains it clearer and um, more succinctly. Hopefully this um, is illuminating for you. It's, uh, so the total development cost is $116.4 million. The municipal contribution, including the land costs, is 10.1 million, which brings the cost of development down to 106 million. Less forecasted revenue from the sale of the 218 PAH units that the, the town will control, which is approximately 64 million, which brings it down to the 42.1 million or equivalent to the host co contribution. So I'll pause there and see if there are any questions on that. So this chart is um, in a very high level uh, way showing that if things play out the way that it's being planned or imagined in the, in the budgeting, budgeting and planning, the $116 million project uh, providing 218 PH units to the town and 24 units to athletes would ultimately have a zero impact to in cost of the taxpayer. It camera. would be cost neutral, yes. Cost neutral. Yes. Okay, that doesn't mean that we don't have obligations and responsibilities sure. and costs associated with delivering that because there's $10 million in, in costs there. So right. there are some taxpayer costs in there. Right. Right. Okay, Councillor Sanford. Yes, that's what I was trying to determine. Um, there is a contribution from the municipality that would be required financially plus yes. land plus land yes. plus land um, but it's more of a cost recovery model because the cost will be put in by the host co um, and the municipality and recovered through the sale of the assets that are created through that no we will we will not recover our 10 million no. dollar contribution but so that will be a contribution six million in land and four million in in costs but we are recovering the 64.2 yes. million so it's a there is a municipal contribution but it's also a cost recovery based bringing it to zero right 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 if the council in the future wanted to market those units at a, at a higher rate than is used for this budget to make it truly a zero cost, it would 
also cover that $10 million in, in other costs. Um, would that, would we expect that to affect the subvention? Or is the subvention as shown in this chart fixed through some other calculation? So the subvention will be written into a multi-party agreement. And so the terms under which um, the delivery of the project and, and who gets to decide, we, uh, because there is a, a, um, a host co contribution, and just to be clear, the host corporation is just like the bid co, is a, uh, a partnership organization where you have representatives from the province, the federal government, um, the city of Calgary. Uh, and so these funds are coming from those other levels of government. Uh, if the town was to change the 218 affordable units and sell them all as market units, there would, there would likely be a clause in the multi-party agreement that would um, reopen the discussion on how much the contribution from the host co would be. So in that way, the subvention is somewhat tied to the uh, sale price that might occur. Yes. Thank you. Councilor McCallum. Um, so do these figures include the pedestrian overpass and the flood mitigation? They include parts of them, not all of them. So I have explained um, once before, I believe, to, to Council um, that these projects, the, the Athlete Village project is being um, considered as a standalone development. And as a standalone development, we're looking at what would be the offsite levy costs associated with it and what are the flood mitigation costs associated with this parcel. So the proportion of those projects that are applicable to this parcel are included in these costs. Okay, and so what would be the value of our portion of the flood mitigation and our value of the portion of the pedestrian okay. bridge. I have a slide that shows you that. Oops. Um, I thought this might be a question. So <laughs> we have the athlete village costs along the first row. Town of Canmore costs at 10.1 million, other government costs at 42.1, and the other revenue source, so essentially from the sale of the PAH units, brings you to the total cost of 100. 16 million. The flood mitigation costs, the total cost is in the far column, is 2 million. And that's made up of $630,000 in town costs, which are already included in the village costs, in that $10 million. So included in our 10 million is 630,000 related to flood mitigation. Also included, in the 42 million from other, other governments is $100,000 related to flood mitigation. And then we're proposing that um, there'll be other revenue sources for the flood mitigation from offsite levies from other future parcels, privately owned parcels along and, that. And so is that 1.27 off offsite levies part of the 10 million? No, it's an addition to that. So the, the total cost of the flood mitigation project for Stone Creeks to protect the future lands that have yet mm -hmm. to develop is $2 million. Okay. So we only need to collect $2 million. So what's in the athlete village costs is the 630000 plus the one hundred. So 730000 of the $2 million is included in the athlete village cost. And then for the pedestrian overpass, the estimated total project cost for that is five million. Now of that, the town's total cost is 4.7 million, but in included in the athlete village cost is 1.645 million. I know this is... You could send these slides out. Please. I can. And there are also some village contributions in other government, or sorry, some pedestrian overpass contributions in the cost of uh, the athlete village contribution from the other government partners as well. Now there is opportunity to seek grant funds to deliver that project and reduce the total 
cost to the town for the pedestrian overpass. There are other uh, privately held parcels along Palliser Trail that we could negotiate with developers there to contribute to this project. We could also go after grants from um, infrastructure, if we can get green trip grants, for example, to support pedestrian infrastructure, if we can um, get Alberta transportation grants to support safety infrastructure, these are the types of grants that we would try to seek for this project. Thank you. Okay. So that's where I left off with just the cost neutral neutrality of the project, but it does need to be financed because we don't get the 64 million from the sale of the units in its entirety until after people take possession of their units. So this next section of the table uh, goes through the construction financing. So we go back to the total cost of development being 116.4 million. Less our municipal land contribution, because we, we don't have to finance that, we already own that land. Less the offsite levy requirement, because um, we don't have to finance that, we've already financed uh, those funds. And less the host coast subvention amount of 42 million brings us to um, a $66 million uh, financing requirement to deliver the project. Uh, any questions on that? Councillor Sanford? Maybe you're going to get to this, but um, what we're being asked to do today is we're not crafting a borrowing bylaw. We're not borrowing money at this point in time. No, you're not. Well, yes, and so maybe that's a good point, Councillor Sanford. I, I sh should be clear that the, I, the purpose today is to get you to the point where you have an understanding of how we can deliver a project like this so that when it comes time to vote whether or not you support the bid in a few weeks' time, you have an understanding. And so the only way we can have an understanding if we can deliver this project is to understand what it will cost to finance it and whether or not we have the capacity in our uh, debt and borrowing limits to deliver it. So that's where we're at. The answer to that question is no. And in your report, you'll have seen this section of the Municipal Government Act um, that gives us direction when we have a request to borrow beyond our debt limit, we can seek special borrowing approval from the Minister of Municipal Affairs in accordance with Section 252 of the MGA. And that would kick in in 2024? That would kick in, in in 2024. So it's, I've been in discussions with municipal affairs officials on this project. This is unusual, but not um, uncommon. So it is very common for municipalities to request this special approval from the ministers to um, go beyond their debt limit. Uh, what is uncommon or unusual is that we're requesting it in advance of actually knowing that we want to deliver this project and in advance, so far in advance of having to deliver it. So this is just one step and a borrowing bylaw would have to follow at some future date. Yes. And then it would have But we would readings, We would be so. offside of the MGA to pass a borrowing bylaw right. until we got the special request from the minister. And we can't get the special request from the minister until council passes a resolution requesting one. So that's the intent of the resolution today. So this is an unusual thing because we don't normally take this step. That's right. Right. Okay, thank you. That's right. So this next table is, was not in your um, uh, package, and I apologize for that. Uh, and I had worked with um, Mr. Irwin in finance to identify, we've just been putting budgets together to present to the finance committee, so we're looking at what our total indebtedness will potentially be in 2024 when we potentially need to take this debt. Um, so he helped me put together this table. So right, the, the first column is our current year. First row is where we are at um, for debt limits. So in our current year, our current debt limit, it is 87 million. Council will know that that debt limit is tied to revenues of the municipality that are non, um, 
other government sources, so non-grant revenue. Between 2019 and 2024, our revenues are proposed to increase by another 29 million. So our debt limit in the year 2024 is projected to be 116 million. Currently, we owe 40 million. We have, that's what we've taken in debt. And over the time period of 2019 to 24, we will pay down 21 million of that current debt. So if we never took another dollar of debenture, mm -hmm. In 2024, we would have $19 million left in debt. Uh, but based on the budget that will be coming forward to you, there's a range of projects um, and a range of funding sources, and uh, it'll be up to council to decide in a five-year plan. Actually, we're bringing you a six-year plan, which just happens to end in 2024, so we have this now. The range is between 38 and $55 million of new debt. So we'll be dropping down 21 million, but likely increasing it based on new projects. So the long and the short of it is um, at the end of this, we, you know, if you take our, our total debt limit uh, in 2024 of 116 million, and you subtract what our projected debt owing, which would be between 57 and 74 million, we'd have room of between 42 and 59 million of debt and we want to take a $66 million debenture to potentially deliver the Athlete Village. So we don't have the debt limit to do it, hence we need the ministerial authority to do the borrowing, uh, and you need the um, comfort that the minister is willing to consider that in order to make a decision on supporting the bid. So that's where we're at right now. It's a bit of chicken and egg or cart and horse, but we've had the discussion Council Council felt that it was uh, um, appropriate to bring this recommendation forward. So, so just, just a question on, on that. So when it comes to 2024, if, if this project should move forward, Council of the Day is gonna have to then kick everything in. And draw down the additional debt that presumably the ministers approved of 66 million. I'm just wondering if, if through that uh, decision, council will actually hit the debt limit for two years or whatever until everything clears. So there, in speaking with the uh, administration at Municipal Affairs, these orders um, approved by the minister can be amended and are regularly based on the actual uh, requirements of the municipality in the year in question. Um, part of the order will also have the term of the borrowing, so we're currently proposing that be for a five-year term, um, and that may change. There may be reasons we want to borrow for longer, based on market conditions, and so we would request an amendment at that time. So those are all things that would be done at later dates. Councilman Callum. You had, thank you. Uh, you just, just before you said that, that uh, you gave me the eye too. Was, yeah, you said something like that you thought that this was, council had felt that it was prudent to bring this forward or that it was. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we had uh, a was it discussion. Council or was it had been, sorry. No, it was a discussion. I, I believe it, it was either the workshop that we had with okay. council where we talked about whether we bring the decision on the bid before we bring this motion or okay. whether we bring this motion before we bring the decision on the okay. bid. Because you can do it either way. Right. Um, but I, I sought advice from municipal affairs and they felt it was they did not need your decision on the bid, but they did need a resolution of council to support the request. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. So, more, no more question. Just the, the <laughs> proposed recommendation, it is long worded. The um, basis of it is in the, the last paragraph uh, where uh, we were requesting the Minister of the uh, Municipal Affairs to authorize a net borrowing of $66 million 
necessary for development of the Athlete Village in Canmore under the following terms, debt to be drawn in 2024 for a period of less than five years with debt repayment to be funded from sale of PAH units. And again, that um, resolution has been reviewed by administration at Municipal Affairs. So if there are... Municipal Affairs has read this particular Yes. Rule. Great. Are there questions then for Ms. DeSoto at this time? Seeing none. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just to clarify, we have room in our debt limit at that point in time. We are just asking to have a net borrowing of 66,000, 66 million, sorry. So um, we don't have the full amount. We don't the have room. the full amount, but we do have some debt we room. We do have some okay. debt room, yes. And it's in the range of 59 million to 42 million to 59 million. So right. we have sort of almost enough for 66 but we there would be a need to exceed that right um is there any risk that municipal affairs won't approve this is it something that we i mean we can ask right so, so um if they don't approve it then there is um i would not be recommending to council that council sign the guarantee or agree to guaranteeing on delivery of the athlete village and uh, that is an option an alternative that i uh, wrote up in the report is that if, if council feels it's inappropriate to guarantee the delivery of this project then we could refuse to sign the guarantee and another order of government would have to do that um, we're not recommend i'm not recommending that at this point in time i i believe there's um, adequate robustness in the numbers and, and review that's been done and our experience in delivering PAH projects is increasing. Um, I think we know the demand is there and I think uh, by having control and guarantee, by guaranteeing the project, we guarantee that we have control over it. Um, and so I'm thinking that this is something that we can do as a full partner of the Olympic bid should that go forward. Right. Um, I don't think I understood from the report that we did have room in our debt limit. So that's good there to know. There is some room. Yeah. It's just not so the there full is room. some room. So yeah. this just ensures that we have the capability to commit to this amount of money, regardless of what right. debt room we have. And I think it, it also gives council the uh, understanding that um, you have some flexibility to, uh, to do other community priorities um, and you wouldn't not be able to do some of your other projects that you might want to proceed with because you're delivering this project. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hillstad was next on the button. Thank you for your presentation. So if we go ahead with this and they give the okay and then bid falls through, do we have to make another resolution to remove this or is it just automatically? No, we'll just withdraw it. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure it's not binding. Councillor Mara. Oh, sorry, I, I'm. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just looking here. Um, how would it, do you think the perception in the public would be if we approve this? Does that look like we're approving and moving forward with the Olympic bid when we're doing it in advance of public hearings, or this just sort of says if we move? if uh, we want the information so that we can move forward if we choose to. Like, how, does, how do you think that'll play out in the public? This. No, I, no, I know the perception, like. Yeah, and I, you know, I, um, like I think that's for, for you to, uh, to, to determine mm -hmm. uh, based on what you've heard in the public, mm -hmm. but um, my perspective is that you need the answer to this question mm -hmm in order to understand that you have the capability to deliver on the project. I mean, you could consider that this is a, a clause in the MGA, it's there for municipalities to use, as long as there's a prudent business case 
to deliver the project, which here there is that, that's showing the cost neutralness of the project, that it's likely to be approved um, in the future should you ask for it. Um, that is another option just to consider. Uh, and okay. and that's, then that's postpone this decision until after that uh, November 6th date. Okay, yeah, thank I, you. I would, I would think that um, if council should choose to support the bid, this would simply give more certainty that um, we would have the ability to do what mm -hmm. we're saying. Councillor McCallum. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so uh, how many communities have done this in the past and for what kind of projects did they borrow for? Were they like long-term borrows or short-term borrows and was it for... Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know that, Councillor McCallum. I do know that um, I, it was told me that it's a very common request mm. to municipal affairs. Cool. But I didn't ask. Um, and so we're looking at borrowing this for this project, but in effect, no matter what happens with the bid, this is actually something we could tap into if we wanted to do a project on our own and ensure that we have the debt room to be able to fulfill other community priorities while we're at it as well. So if the bid didn't go through, we could actually have our own housing project up there and financing, finance the flood mitigation and the pedestrian overpass and piece that out if, if we wanted to, if should the bid not. So yes, you'd have the, the same opportunity to request mm. the ministerial authority uh, it is based on the ability to deliver the project, the business mm -hmm. case for the yeah, project, right? So there would be a different business case for a different project, but yeah. yes, that... You could just do short-term borrows like you would building for building or two buildings at a time with pre-sales and everything else at a shorter time right. distance. Right. But as we've shown period. with the, um, the financing of this project, that it wouldn't be deliverable uh, without the subvention from... The other government partners of the 42 million it would be we would just have to take out debt to do it that's the point more I'm trying debt to make yeah yes that's the yeah. Point. yeah but it would you you'd have to sell some of the units at market in order to fund which we're a planning project. on doing for this anyways possibly so it's it's a different project but it's the same project different project different, yeah, yeah Di different sure. financing yeah um so we're asking for 66 million dollars uh is that being considered in 2024 dollars or is that a based on our the budgets that we've seen are all 2018 budget numbers or 2018 numbers are we um assuming that we will have enough debt limit to be able to deal with the cost right. of uh the increased cost of construction or value in that might come so these are 2018 figures yes uh there are figures that the bidco has produced that that are 2026 mm -hmm. dollars and and so they they have been inflated so it it can and will be likely that the 66 million will be something higher come 2024 Four. but we won't know that until we do detailed design and we get to the point where we're um, putting the final request through. And so if the minister agrees to it now, then it's not something that a minister could unagree to after we've signed, signed uh, our multi-party agreement. We're basically yeah. looking for a pre-approval for credit. It's basically we're, we're looking for of. a pre-approval to deliver this project, yeah. yes. And the province, should the bid proceed, the province would be a full partner in delivery of the games. And so, yes, I, I don't foresee a situation where they wouldn't um, assist with the authority to deliver the project. Okay. Um, and so is the city of Calgary being asked to provide a guarantee of their own funds as well? Uh, because the two items that you refer to are that the ministerial uh, minister's office would like this uh, brought forward and that the bid corporation um, has uh, demanded it as well. So is the city of Calgary doing something similar? So the city of Calgary has the host city contract that they have to sign. The host city contract has all of the guarantees in it. If another government partner doesn't sign the guarantee for each venue mm -hmm. and each new construction, then the city of Calgary has to sign it. So yes, for all of their accommodation, for their athlete village, they will have to sign the guarantees. 
Um, and I'm just trying to understand why we're being asked so early in the process and it no, we're, we're being asked at the same time as, oh, okay. as all of the others. We can't deliver on our ask, so that's why in order to sign that guarantee, mm -hmm. we need to have this special authority um, approved. Okay, and then um, in your uh, report, you state that if we had another order of government sign the guarantee for us, you feel that we would lose control of the project. Um, how would we lose control of the project when we own the land? Well, I do say that we would have some control mm. through the land, but I, I would say it, we wouldn't um, essentially be delivering the project. If we're not signing the guarantee, then it could be that the province or the HOSCO is actually the developer of the project. Um, I mean, we could, we could negotiate um, whatever we'd, we want to with those partners. Uh, but right now, based on the knowledge that we have and the subvention that's proposed and the fact that we deliver affordable housing in Canmore already, it's our land, it's our community housing corporation, I think it makes sense for us to be in full control of the project and by having the, the full um, costs and the guarantee to deliver it, I think that gives us the greatest level of control. Interesting. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Ms. DeSoto at this time? Seeing none, thanks very much for your presentation. And once again, I get to read a lot of motion. I don't think you have to read it out. You can. You don't think so? No. Ms. Ms. Hyde, do I need to read the entire motion out? No. No. Okay. <laughs> You know, just for the fun of it, I'll read it out. So whereas the town of Canmore, along with the City of Calgary, Government of Alberta, Government of Canada, Canadian Olympic Committee, and Canadian Paralympic Committee, is a member of Calgary 2026 BIDCO, who is preparing a bid for the 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games, and whereas the BIDCO is requesting the town of Canmore to sign a guarantee to deliver the proposed athlete village in Canmore for a total project cost of 116 million, and whereas the town of Canmore will not have sufficient room within our legislated debt limit to deliver a project of this value. Now therefore, in accordance with section 252 of the MGA, Canmore Council hereby requests the Minister of Municipal Affairs to authorize the net borrowing of $66 million necessary for the development of the proposed athlete's village in Canmore under the following terms. Debt to be drawn down in 2024 for a period of less than five years with debt repayment to be funded from the sale of PH units. So that's the motion. And I'll speak in support of the motion. I'm very interested in moving forward with the discussion and. Uh, hearing from the public and then having the opportunity for council to discuss the resolution that we've been anticipating for a couple of years of whether or not to support an Olympic bid or a games bid for the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2026. Um, one of the, one of probably the most important legacy in, in my mind from being a host it would be to uh, provide this housing project to meet the needs of our community and in order to deliver on that that need this request from the minister or to the minister is uh, is one more step that we have to take to get to a final decision uh, clearly, comfort, uh, council would be more comfortable in, in, that, in that point in having to make a decision on whether or not to support the bid. We'd be more comfortable knowing that we've addressed this funding aspect of the, the whole project. So for that reason and many others, I'll support this motion. 
And I'll look to other members of council to speak to the motion. Councillor Comfort. I will also support this motion. It allows us to continue and to realize the potential for housing that we otherwise could not anticipate doing for a much longer period of time. Um, and also, we're not really committing to anything at this point. We're just opening the potential. So I will support the motion. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I will support the motion. I think it's a good question to ask of municipal affairs. If we are to move forward with this process, we would have to have the certainty of where the money is coming from. And with a $42 million subvention from the bid or the host co, um, I think that's a major contribution that would make a project like this feasible in the town of Canmore. I think the negotiation that Ms. DeSoto has undertaken it really speaks to the needs of our community, and I commend her for bringing back the suggestion that we should continue on this path and to address the financial component of that. I, I think we need to do this at this point in time, and I will be happy to support the motion. Councillor Mara. Thank you, Your Worship. I too will support this motion. Uh, I agree with my fellow councillors so far. Um, I just, it just gives us that little, little bit more information that we can have to make an informed decision, so I will be in support. Councillor Hillstead. I will also be in support of this motion. Um, I think we need the information because there's always a chance they'll say no. So be good to know that beforehand because that will uh, definitely play into considerations if something like that happens. So, Councillor McCallum. I'll reluctantly support this. I'm worried about how this is going to play out in the public. I actually was the one that, and I don't know if anybody else, that had wanted to wait to have this brought to council, so I was quite surprised to see it on the agenda. I'd also point out that I know that we're grateful to have this opportunity, but at the same time, housing is a provincial responsibility. And as was provided for me, um, in 2016, we sent $54 million alone in um, taxation benefits to the provincial government, and um, we're going to have to wait six or seven years to see this, and we're going to have to take all the liability on it. So uh, I understand it's basically like pre-authorizing our credit card to see if whether we have the credit to make it happen. But I'm worried we're going to max it out. But I'll support it. Any other discussion on the motion? See none, I'll call the question. Those in favor, opposed, motion's carried unanimously. And I believe that takes us to the end of the agenda, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll move the council be adjourned. Those in favor, opposed, we're adjourned. <laughs>